of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisibly with liberty and justice for all. Okay, Kelly, would you please take roll call? Trustee Bradal. Here. Trustee Brocchini. Here. Trustee Doggett is not able to join us tonight. Trustee Steele. Here. Trustee Villalobos. Here. Thank you. Okay, the district digitally records the audio and video portions of the meetings. All recordings are kept in the superintendent's office for 30 days and are available during that time period for inspection by members of the public on district equipment without charge. Speakers wishing to address the board on agenda or non-agenda items, please submit your first and last name and the agenda item you wish to speak on in the Q&A area of the webinar. Please do not submit comments or questions in the Q&A area. You will be called to address the board. Your microphone will be unmuted and you may speak up to three minutes. After you have spoken, your microphone will be muted. Report out on closed session. The board met in closed session regarding public performance evaluation and no action was taken. Um, item seven, the approval of the minutes for February 3rd, 2021 board work study. Uh, are there any questions um, regarding the minutes of February 3rd? And I will call through the trustees. Trustee Burkini? No questions. Trustee Steele? No questions. Trustee Villalobos? No questions. Okay, do I have a motion to approve the February 3rd, 2021 board work study meeting? I'll, I'll make a motion to approve. To... <laughs> I'll make a motion to approve. Do I have a second? I'll second. Okay, um, Kelly, can you take the vote? Sure, can I just clarify who seconded? I... Trustee Villalobos or Trustee Steele? Trustee Villalobos, thank you. Okay, uh, Trustee Bradal. Yes. Trustee Brocchini. Yes. Trustee Steele? Yes. Trustee Villalobos. Yes. The motion passes 4-0, thank you. Okay, um, the approval of the minutes for February 10th. Uh, it is recommended that the board approve the minutes of February 10th regular board meeting. Are there any questions regarding the minutes of February 10th? Trustee Burkini? No questions. Trustee Steele? No questions. Trustee Villalobos? No questions. Okay, Kelly, can you take the roll call, please? Oh, do I have a motion to approve? Sorry, we'll have to do that again. Motion to approve the um, minutes of February 10th? I can. <laughs> I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of February 10th. I'll second. Okay. And Kelly, can you take the roll call vote? Trustee Bradal. Yes. Trustee Brocchini? Yes. Trustee Steele? Yes. Trustee Villalobos? Yes. The motion passes 4 0. Thank you. We have a lot of minutes. Um, so, approval of the minutes of March 2nd, 2021. Um, are there any questions regarding the minutes of March 2nd, 2021? And that's was the board governance workshop. Trustee Burkini? No questions. Okay, Trustee Steele? No questions. Trustee Villalobos? No questions. Okay, do I have a motion to approve the minutes of March 2nd, 2021? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of March 2nd, 2021. Do I have a second? I'll second. Okay, Kelly, can you take the roll call vote? Trustee Bradal. Yes. Trustee Burkini? Yes. Trustee Steele? Yes. Trustee Villalobos? Yes. Thank you. The motion passes 4 0. Okay, approval of the minutes of March 3rd, 2021, Board Governance Workshop. Are there any questions regarding the minutes of March 3rd, 2021? Trustee Burkini? No questions. Trustee Steele? No questions. Trustee Villalobos? No questions. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes of March 3rd, 2021? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of March 3rd, 2021. 
Do I have a second? Seconded. Okay, Kelly, can you take a roll call vote? Trustee Bradal. Yes. Trustee Brocchini? Yes. Trustee Steele? Yes. Trustee Villalobos? Yes. Thank you, the motion passes 4-0. Okay, um, approval of the agenda and consent agenda. Uh, all items on the consent agenda will be approved with one motion, which is not debatable, and which requires unanimous vote for passage. If any member of the board, the superintendent, or the public so requests, each item, any item can be removed from the section and placed on the regular order of business following approval of the consent agenda. Okay, are there any questions regarding the approval of the agenda and the consent agenda? Trustee Burkini? Um, can I pull E and G out of the consent agenda? Okay. E and G, surplus and technology? Okay. All right, um, Trustee Steele? No questions. Trustee Villalobos? I was wondering if we could move the budget report uh, before the return to school. This is for the consent agenda? I'm sorry, no questions. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, and I have no questions, so. Um, but before you, uh, before you go and vote on the approval of the agenda is that Laverne is correct, is that in the consent agenda, we agree to the uh, order of the agenda. And so it's A, uh, agenda of the March 10th meeting. So if we want to move something, we should do that now. We should, um, so we should actually probably pull that out as another item so that we could have a little bit of discussion on uh, setting the agenda on that one. So let's pull that. Okay, so um, now we're looking to vote on the consent agenda, taking out A, the agenda for March 10th, um, item E, the request for proposal for technology infrastructure, and G, the declaration of surplus equipment. Um, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda minus those three items? I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda minus A, E, and G. Do I have a second? I'll second. Okay, Kelly, can you take a vote, please? Trustee Bradal. Yes. Trustee Brocchini. Yes. Trustee Steele. Yes. Trustee Villalobos. Yes. Thank you, the motion passes 4-0. Okay, we'll go to, I guess, the, the agenda for March 10th, and Dr. Olson. Um, so uh, the question is, is uh, Laverne requested that we do the budget discussion before we return to school? Um, and Laverne, do you want to say a little bit more about that? And then we can look at uh, making an motion to do that. Um, my, I'm requesting it because returning to school uh, has a lot to do with our budget and the monies that we're receiving. And I just think it would be beneficial to know where we stand financially before we return to the school. Okay, so that would mean moving item C and B, just exchanging those two items. So assuming that Laverne was a first for that, is there a second? I'll second. Okay. And then a vote, please. Trustee Bradal. Yes. Trustee Burkini. Yes. Trustee Steele. Yes. Trustee Villalobos. Yes. Thank you, the motion passes 4-0. And then uh, consent agenda item E, request for a proposal for technology infrastructure. Um, Trustee Burkini, you had a question? Yeah, I just uh, wanted more clarity, clarity on what kind of technology infrastructure we're talking about. Are we talking about wires through walls? Are we talking about data entry? Are we talking about website building? What are we talking about there? Would you like, would you like me to answer that? Please. 
Okay. Um, so uh, there, first we're contracting for a, a technology, technology infrastructure upgrade and what the contractors will provide um, and based off, um, based off what is involved in this technology uh, infrastructure upgrade is they'll install, configure, and warranty new network cabling, uh, network electronics, both local and wireless network, <coughs> network security, and they'll hyper-converge computer storage systems infrastructure, which is known as HCI. Um, they the 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 systems that they will install will be capable of providing high speed, high available, secure, and private network access and virtual server infrastructure to all seven schools and the district office. I don't know if that helps, Linda, but that's kind of the summary of what they'll do. So there's a lot of wiring. There's a lot of um, you know wireless equipment that's put in there, racks and and all the things that are involved with the network. But it's for the purpose of uh, bringing us uh, more to the 21st century. <laughs> you know, we're this is something that's long, long overdue. Yeah, great. I just I just wanted clarity on what that was exactly. So thank you. That answers and, my question. Uh, the item that you're approving tonight is um, is just simply um, we're going to advertise for a request for proposals. This is a big piece of our bond. Uh, as you know, we put $12 million of our bond aside for technology. This is an infrastructure upgrade that will be probably in the category of about $7 million, which is not what you're approving tonight. Tonight, you're just approving the materials that are going out to the people that will put in a bid. Yeah, So, but also I want to add that the it, it was in the background of the memo that you received, but it's really that you are approving the idea that we will be looking at the the three lowest bidders that qualify uh, within the the constraints of the of the qualification within the RFP. So it's it's that's the big piece that you're approving. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Should we vote on this item before we go to the next? Okay, so. Um, do I have a motion to approve the request for a proposal for technology infrastructure? I'll make a motion to approve. Do I have a second? I'll second. Okay. Um, Kelly, can you take the vote? Trustee Bradal. Yes. Trustee Brocchini. Yes. Trustee Steele. Yes. And Trustee Villalobos. Yes. Thank you. The motion passes 4-0. Okay. Um, item G, the declaration of surplus equipment. Um, Trustee Burkini, did you have a question for Josie Peterson? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just curious. So this is an old van we're getting rid of, it looks like. And I'm just curious what the process is as far as getting rid of it. Do we sell it or is it just um, trashed or just what the process is? Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Brocchini. Um, we have a, a, a company called uh, Gov.Deals, and so um, they they help school districts surplus property, and they have a website, and they do the advertising, and so we would um, reach out to them and give them the specs of this vehicle, and then they could uh, sell it for us. All right, thank you. I just wanted clarity on it. Thank you. Okay, did we have any other questions during this time? Okay, do I have a motion to approve the declaration of surplus equipment? I'll make a motion to approve the declaration for surplus equipment. Okay, do I have a second? I'll second that. Okay, Kelly, can you take the roll call vote? S.T. Bradal. Yes. Trustee Brocchini? Yes. Trustee Steele? Yes. Trustee Villalobos? Yes. Thank you. The motion passes 4-0. Okay, hey, communications. Um, speakers wishing to address the board on agenda items or non-agenda um, non items, please submit your first and last name in the agenda you wish to, item you wish to speak on in the Q&A area of the webinar. Please do not submit comments or questions in the Q&A area. You will be called to address the board. Your microphone will be unmuted and you may speak for up to three minutes. 
After you have spoken, your microphone will be muted. Okay, LSEA. Good evening. One year ago this week, LSEA members were lining the streets of Pacifica before and after school with support from our CSEA colleagues and parent community. We were holding signs like pay raise, not a pay cut, retain and attract, not disrespect and attack, and teachers deserve a fair contract. The last time we were all gathered together in person was the board meeting at Sunset Ridge. It was March 11th, 2020, standing room only, we were overflowing. The World Health Organization had declared COVID-19 a global pandemic that very day. How quickly the world has changed, globally and locally, we have had a shocking 12 months. Before the closed session meeting, LSEA leadership came to speak at public comment before the board met. We were eager to be heard in a more intimate setting before the public arrived. Patty McNally took the mic and proudly spoke about the pride she had at being a member of the Pacifica community and a teacher of our district. She was eager to get us to work together and come to an agreement. On tonight's agenda, we will be honoring her. We will share with you how she was the ultimate teammate. Also on this evening's agenda is approval of our MOU around returning to school. LSEA and the district ended on a very positive note. It is our hope that as we begin contract negotiations on March 22nd, we remember the positive feelings we have now. We can all agree, Pacifica teachers deserve a pay raise, not a pay cut. Pacifica School District needs to retain and attract, not disrespect and attack. Pacifica teachers deserve a fair contract. We look forward to negotiating with you on March 22nd. Thank you. Okay, CSEA. Sounds, we can't hear you, Nicole. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm Nicole Sayers and I'm the president of CSEA Chapter 128. I'd like to start by thanking the Pacifica School District for sending 11 of our members to the annual CSEA Pair Educators Conference March 3rd through 5th. This is a virtual conference and the district paid for 11 staff to attend. We kind of made a deal and our chapter agreed to send uh, anyone after 10, but the district went ahead and paid for all 11 and for that we really thank you. This annual conference is always, a pop, is always popular and this year has been no different. I've heard so many positive things from those who went about all the good sessions that they were able to attend. Some members attended technology, how to best work with students and even cooking sessions. It is, a very, nice, it is very nice that classified members have this conference to look forward to every year. I also wanted to thank President Berdahl and Trustee Villalobos for attending our chapter meeting in January and February. Our members really enjoyed the time they shared with both of you and we hope you'll come again. I would also like to thank Linda Brocchini for reaching out and we look forward to hosting her in April. One last thank you goes out to the entire board for taking the bold action and deciding not to open in-person learning until all the school staff have had the opportunity to have access to the vaccines. We all know that this decision delayed the reopening of school, but it means so much to us that you considered our health and safety so seriously. Since last month, our CSEA members have continued to keep things in our district running, maintained and cleaned. They are continuing to work with students in learning hubs and virtually. They continue preparing hot meals and work with district, district administration to keep things running smoothly on that end. We are essential to this district. Our members are all thankful to be employed during these hard times. That being said, we also realize that making ends meet continues to be a struggle. With rising food costs, housing costs, living expenditures, and only a 1% wage increase back in 2018, living a healthy and good life here in Pacifica is getting more difficult every month. CSA leadership is more than willing to help the district look at budget and determine if and determine if and how there are ways to bring more funding into this district. We also uh, take a look, would like also like to take a look at spending practices in a more wise manner. We all deserve to live our best life and we really need to strive forward in making sure that all school staff receive a living wage. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Um, now we have people wishing to address the board. 
I think most people are going to be for the return to school item. Uh, this time right now is for non-agenda items. Um, Christina Bailey, it just says public comment, so I'm I'm thinking that's return to school. It is. Okay. All right. So we'll we'll bring you back then when um, when we're uh, for that subject item. Okay. And then we have Jesse. Uh, no, that's 12C. Okay. Angelique Berry is a non-agenda item. Yes, and Rebecca. Um, I can't pronounce the last name. Oh. Uh, for graduation and. Rebecca Derricks. Yes. Those are not on the agenda tonight. So those two. Perfect. Um, so either order, I suppose. Uh, we have Angelique Berry, so let's uh, open it up for her. Okay, and you'll have three minutes. I don't know if you can see the timer. I can, uh, thank you. Okay, so we, we, yeah, we are gonna, because of the amount of people wanting to address the board, we're gonna stick to the three minutes this evening. I totally Go ahead. understand, thank you. <laughs> Um, thank you, board members and Superintendent Olson, um, for the opportunity to speak tonight. I'm a parent of three children who attend Cabrillo School. I went to Valley Mar and returned there to teach. I believe in our district's mission and vision so much so that I enrolled my children in this district, even though I go over the hill with myself to teach. First, as a teacher, I would like to thank the board for putting the teacher safety first and ensuring that their vaccinations are complete before reopening. However, as a parent, I am so disappointed and saddened and angry about the hybrid plan that our children are being offered. Can we put their learning and education first? My children will receive less instructional time with their teachers, and this will be to their detriment. However, now that teachers are vaccinated and we're trending down in the tiers, they should be getting more time. This should be now their priority. I realize that there is nothing you can do. You have already approved the spring reopening plan and that's why I'm speaking now as a non-agenda item. But did you talk to parents? Did you hear them? Did you hear the kids? Have you listened? If you had, you would know that they wanna be back in school. Some have done well in distance learning, but certainly not all. And shouldn't you be meeting the needs of all of our children? I do not know what the fall reopening plan is. But if it's not five days a week, it is not enough. Mm -hmm. We need to be increasing their time and making up for their learning loss. Since our teachers are fully vaccinated and you have hired additional janitorial staff, then you must create a plan that has our students back to school five days a week. Because honestly, they are the ones who have lost the most. And now we and you should make them your number one priority. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Angelique. Now we'll have Rebecca. Okay. Hello. Hi, yes. Rebecca. We can hear you. Oh. Okay. Hi. So my name is Rebecca Derricks, and I have two children that attend Cabrillo School. One is a seventh grader, and one is an eighth grader. I have several concerns. One is why we can't have an eighth grade graduation that is in person with limited attendees and is outside. Our teenagers haven't been able to socialize with their peers for the past year, over a year by the time graduation comes. If we are lucky, they will get 12 days of in-class instruction for this year. Having a graduation would be bring closure to the kids who've been in school together since kindergarten and give them a sense of camaraderie before they part ways. This is a pivotal moment in their lives that should be celebrated in person, not on a computer screen. My second concern is that the same thing will happen over the summer that happened last summer. That come fall, there won't be a plan that's going to offer our children more than the hybrid plan that is currently being offered. Other districts worked over summer and were ready to roll and open come fall. I am confused to why children will not be going to school at all on Wednesdays as well. Can we look into a rotating Wednesday schedule so we can get the kids into class more often? At what point can a whole class be a stable group versus a cohort? Is our goal to just meet the bare minimum, which I assume is 10 hours a week, since that is what was offered for online and now hybrid? Our teachers will be vaccinated, so that is no longer an obstacle come fall. Schools in El Dorado Hills have been open daily for two hours a day since October. 
They are currently in the red tier as well. And starting next week, they will be in school five hours a day with their whole class, whole typical class being a stable group with four feet spacing between the desks. They fought and appealed certain issues such as play the playground being open, going to a five hour day, desk placement, gym opening, and they won. We can't just sit back and not be proactive. This is not unattainable. If they can do it, so can we. I'd also like you to let us know what needs to happen to get our kids back to school every day come fall so we all know what is expected and are on the same page. Is it a certain tier, et cetera? Also, for fall, when asking what plan parents choose, can, be, can we be clear what each plan means? I assumed when choosing hybrid or in-person, it meant going back when possible. I assume parents who were undecided would have chosen online school for the year. Families need to know what they're choosing so they can choose wisely as not to affect families who choose to go back when we were able to via county and California Department of Health regulations. I am a preschool teacher here in Pacifica and have been working since August. Okay, um, the next one for a non-agenda item um, would be Gianna Pellerini. I'm not pronounced that correctly, regarding graduation. Okay, do we have Gianna? I think it's under Sharon P. If you're looking for the the Zoom square, thank you. Can you hear me? We can. Yes. Thank you. Hello, my name is G Gigi Pellariti. I'm currently an eighth grader at Cabrillo School, and I'm writing you to express my sadness and disappointment that the board has made the decision to have only virtual graduation this year. I believe the decision has been made too early without considering all the data and to think of alternative ways to have an in-person graduation. I have been at Cabrillo for nine years. Eighth grade was supposed to be a special year. Nine years is a long time to be at one place. As I write this letter, we have been in distant learning for almost a year now. A year gone, 11 months, 51 weeks, 355 days, four hours and seven minutes and counting. We have had to miss so much already. We're gonna miss the special picture in front of the steps at Cabrillo, celebrating that we've been there since kindergarten. No trip to Yosemite, no dinner dance, and all the other fun stuff eighth graders get to do. I had to accept the disappointment but I held out hope for some kind of in-person graduation. San Mateo County is currently predicted to go into the orange tier between March 16th and March 29th. Vaccines are here, teachers have started them. I know that I am not the only eighth grader in Pacifica that was holding on to this hope. Our class was crushed with the news of virtual graduation. I'm asking the board and principals of the schools to meet again and reconsider this and consider the alternatives, like an outdoor socially distant graduation that can be done. Some examples, the students could spread, be spaced apart in an outdoor setting like Terra Nova, Oceana, large grass field area of Cabrillo. We have limited guests, siblings only, and of course parents. <laughs> socially distanced from one another, mask on. It will not be easy, but I know that the parents are willing to help. We can do this, it's not complicated and it can be done. I hope you will rethink this and think of this for um, consideration. Thank you for your time. Sharon, um, typically one doesn't respond to public comment and uh, I won't in this uh, because you can only speak to agendized items in a board meeting. But if you hold on to uh, 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 the presentation on the return to school, you will probably get more information on that presentation. So uh, please uh, stay with us in the board meeting. Okay, and then we have Michelle Frutel um, regarding COVID money.
COVID money actually is a board agenda item okay. and it's uh, in uh, Ms. Peterson's presentation. Oh, okay. All right, so we will hold it. Um, is that the return to school or is that the budget? Uh, it's actually a little bit in both, okay. um, but we probably will talk about it in the budget. Okay. So then the other one would be Stephanie Harrington regarding graduation. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, my name is Stephanie Harrington. I am a mother of four. Three of them are Cabrillo. My oldest is in eighth grade, and I am uh, writing or reading a letter that I wrote to Dr. Olson. Uh, Dr. Olson, I hope this email finds you and your family well. As this year has taught us more than ever, family and our health is most important. I am reaching out regarding the district's decision to cancel in-person graduation for all of Pacifica School District's eighth grade classes. Not only is this a huge disappointment, this seems the opposite direction in which we are moving towards. Schools nationally and locally have reopened and are, or are in the process of reopening. We in the Pacifica School District are receiving emails with surveys to return to school. COVID numbers are dropping daily. We are in the single digits, if any, COVID patients at local hospitals. San Mateo County is nearing the orange tier and vaccinations are becoming more and more available every day. How does canceling in-person graduation fall amongst these strides we have made? Our children have suffered time and time again this past year. During some of the most developmental years of their lives, they have been ripped out of school, forced to adjust to distance learning, lost most, if not all socialization with their friends, dealt with cancellations of their eighth grade trips and dinner dances, lost opportunity after opportunity to make lifelong memories. Our children are disengaged. They have suffered academically, emotionally, and socially. They need something to look forward to. And Pacifica School District has prematurely taken that away from them. Another milestone they can never get back. There are many ways to make this happen for the families who wish to participate and feel safe and comfortable with doing so. We could limit the amount of attendees to parents and siblings, safely social distance in our own pods, distance each graduate six feet apart in an outdoor area. We have lots and lots of outdoor areas. I'm gonna skip over this because I'm running out of time. It may make um, take more work and thinking outside of the box, but I can guarantee we have the support of enough parents to make it happen. I'm happy to share the solutions we have come up with that can work for all, school all schools within the district, not just my own. There is a way. As I stated in the beginning of my email, family and health are most important. Health comes in many different forms. Mental health, which is often overlooked, especially during this year, is very important. An in-person graduation is very important. Our children need this. I am begging you to please reconsider. That's it, thank you. Thank you. Um, please stay with us for the COVID update. And then we have um, Sheila Ornelas, uh, also regarding eighth grade graduation. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, I am a mother, I have an eighth grader at, at um, Cabrillo, and I'm very disappointed in the decision to cancel in-person graduation this June. My older son graduated from Terra Nova in May of 2020, and the Jefferson Union High School District here in Pacifica allowed a drive-up drive graduation where the student who was dressed in cap and gown got out of their car with their parents and was able to walk up to the principal while graduation music was playing. They announced the name, his name on a speaker and allowed us to take pictures. This occurred late in June of 2020, but considering the state of COVID at that time, it was already known that this could be done safely and with masks, and it was. Fast forward to last week when Pacifica School District announced a fully virtual graduation. The infection rate continues to decrease, the availability and distribution of vaccines are on the rise, and yet this is the decision? The fact that these children have suffered over the last 12 months being isolated from friends, family members that we haven't seen in a year and in an in-distance learning model, this decision seems especially cruel. The mental toll is hard to describe, and frankly, it shocks me that the district would make this decision when it's completely possible to have safe in-person graduation this year. 
It's unacceptable that the district finds it too much trouble to put together a safe in-person graduation. Coupling this with the fact that no, coupling this with the fact that it is well known that the parents will help in any way asked, there is no excuse. Our county is in, currently in the red tier, which would allow for the scenario I described about my older son last year, and by June will very likely be in the orange tier. I am not naive on the topic of coronavirus. I work in an infectious disease laboratory. We have been performing COVID PCR, COVID neutral, neutralized antibody testing and COVID sequencing for almost a year now, safely in laboratories together since day one. It is possible to be together, especially in an outdoor setting and be safe. This isn't about making up for all the missed milestones of their eighth grade year. Those cannot be, be replaced. This is about providing them hope, something to look forward to, and a sign of a return to normalcy. I implore you to reconsider this decision, just as Jeff Jefferson Union High School did last year, and allow the kids and their families to come together in a safe environment to celebrate this rite of passage. I would also happily chair the Cabrillo graduation event, do as much footwork as possible, I know many, at least 20 families would also do the same. I would be happy to provide guidance to any of the Pacifica School District schools and help that they may need doing the same at their locations. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, then we have Aaron Pickett. Um, it says off agenda item. So as long as it's not returned to school, um, it would be at this time. And can we find Aaron? I don't see your name on the list. Erin? I wonder if she's under. Uh... Uh, she's, the, she's got her hand up. I uh, see her in the attendees. It says she wants to speak on the return to school. So I'm. Um, it's, it's, hi, her, I'm here. I'm here. It okay. says in there, Laverne, that she wanted to speak on hi. an item. So, hi. Can you hear me? <laughs> yep. Hi. Yep. Sorry, sorry about that confusion. I'm sorry. I wasn't able to unmute for a second. Um, thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to comment, number one, that um, I understand the teachers were commenting. Um, there were several comments at the beginning of this meeting about the teachers and their pay raise. And I just want to comment that I am deeply, deeply troubled to think that if this is being used as a cornerstone to get teachers a pay raise, if, our, if we're being prevented from going back to school because we haven't been able to negotiate a pay raise for our teachers, I am extremely troubled. And I wanna echo that and follow up with the comments from Angelique tonight, Rebecca, Sharon, Stephanie, Sheila. I, I am 1000% in agreement with everything they said. Let's get the children back to school. Let's give them a graduation. There are safe and effective ways to do this. And vaccines are opening up. And by mid-April, the teachers will have had two months to get their vaccines. And for the teachers and students that want to go back, let's give this chance to them. They deserve it. They need it. And for the families who wish to stay home and for the teachers who wish to stay home, we can arrange a safe arrangement where they can distance learn and the people who want to be back physically in school should be allowed to be back. We can figure this out. Everyone around us is figuring it out. Berkeley's going to be back in school in three weeks, five days a week. And they said, we will figure this out. Let's show some faith and let's get our children's mental, emotional, 
social, and physical health back on track. My eight-year-old son has said, he wrote me a sentence tonight and said, mom, can you please tell this to the district? I quote him, I'm pretty sure if you were a kid in this pandemic, you would say that you wanna be back. And he signed his name and I said, you know what, babe, I'm gonna read this. And I know I have, we have over 400 people that have signed a petition that agree with us that it's time to do this and we can do it safely. And let's get those teachers vaccinated and let's get back into the classroom. Thank you. Okay, I think that's the last last one. Uh, the others are um, on specific items, so we'll bring them back when we get when we get to the return to school item. Okay, um, correspondence, Dr. Olson. Oops. I do actually have quite a few correspondences, and uh, so one is the uh, first interim uh, letter to, uh, to Trustee Bradall. Uh, that we received from San Mateo County Office of Ed, Denise Porterfield. Um, we will post this on our website, but it is their uh, letter reviewing uh, our board's budget in the first interim that happened in November and uh, recommendations around, um, around um, making sure that we had a structurally balanced budget, um, that we continue to look at reserves and that we continue to look at uh, the cash that we have on hand. Uh, um, Ms. Peterson will discuss that tonight, but we will make sure that this letter is shared with both the board and uh, shared publicly. Um, the second thing that I wanted uh, to let you know is that we're working on a draft of um, a letter for, um, just on behalf of the trustees around the Kent Awards. And so typically the Kent Awards are something that uh, that uh, districts apply for and uh, it's uh, competitive and uh, uh, districts are chosen. We've had a number of Kent Awards. Last year, our homeschool program was a Kent Award winner. The previous year, um, the science program at Sunset Ridge was a recipient. Uh, in this pandemic year, San Mateo County School Boards Association is looking at every school district submitting a um, something unique that they did during the uh, pandemic. Uh, that was unique to their school. Or, and um, so uh, the one that comes to mind, uh, as you know, uh, we've had an incredibly hard year. Um, we have lost, lost four uh, staff members uh, uh, in 2020, uh, Patty McNally being the uh, most recent one in November. Um, in addition to that, um, in terms of the pandemic and, and uh, uh, distance learning that we went quickly into distance learning and as we were talking about returning to school. And uh, some of our teacher leaders have developed um, a, a support circle that now happens uh, every other week. Um, and it's uh, just uh, teachers, it's led by teachers. Uh, it's, it's actually all staff members are invited, but it is led by our staff. There's not an, uh, an administrator that does that. Um, Julie Carrillo was uh, supportive in terms of getting that going, but it was really our SO team and a couple of uh, leaders that really said, we need to support each other. And so those support circles have been uh, really important and uh, people look at them as a resource. Um, and so we're going to submit a letter on your behalf uh, recommending that uh, Pacifica School District be um, supported or be recognized as a part of those support circles. So it's just a two page letter and uh, we've been working with Trustee Villalobos just to uh, get some information, um, but we will put it in the form of a letter uh, on letterhead and ask that it goes off in your um in your name, uh, because that's who submits the uh, Kent Award. So any questions on that? No? Okay, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Uh, it is actually one of the... I, sorry to interrupt. Oh, I was absolutely. just going to make one sort of clarifying. It actually, a lot of this came out of the work of the, the group that gathered in our you know return to school um, meetings over the summer. It was that wellness team um, that kind of came, came up with that idea. So... Um, thankful for their leadership on that, that wellness team. Thank you. Um, and then uh, I, I can just say that I've received uh, numerous, numerous emails in the last week around uh, 
um, uh, staff vaccinations, um, uh, uh, number from parents around returning to school, um, both uh, right away and in the fall, and then also around promotion ceremonies. That's it. Okay, and um, Board Superintendent Communications, Trustee Burkini. Um, okay, so I've done a few things. Um, I first wanted to give a shout out to uh, Kiyomi Arise class in Cabrillo. I was invited to a Valentine's Day of Love concert, and uh, I have to say it was, it just warmed my heart to see those kids singing and just to see the kids being kids. And um, so I'm really thankful for that invitation. Um, I also attended uh, six different um, uh, architect interviews for Measure O. Um, that went really well. And um, I believe at the next meeting, we'll know a little more detail about the results of that of those um, interviews. Um, I also attended the Ortega movie night. And uh, again, great event. It seemed like pretty easy to run. And again, uh, even though we're everybody social distance, it's nice to see the community all together. Um, uh, I guess the other thing I attended this yesterday morning was the uh, CSBA um, school reopening bill, which uh, separating facts from fiction, just kind of over some of the monies that we're going to get around that. And I think uh, Dr. Olson's going to talk to it tonight. And then um, I just want to say one thing that's going on in the uh, world, and I tell my kids this often, is remember what that when you put something on the internet, that it's there and it's there for a long time and it's a reflection on you going forward. Um, we're all neighbors and friends out of this and though we've all been feeling like we're miles away from each other in this Zoom world, um, not too long from now, we're all gonna be together again at PEF galas and Christmas parties and things and it's gonna become a little awkward if maybe we haven't behaved ourselves that well out in the, on social media. So I just wanna remind all the adults as much as I remind my kids that just please be mindful of what you're putting out there because it doesn't go away and it falls you for the rest of your life. And uh, you may or may not be happy about what follows you, so. And um, that's uh, it. I'm looking forward to our presentations tonight. Okay, Trustee Steele. Um, no formal meetings that I set in, but I just want to, you know, give a shout out to the community. You know, over 160 people here today, so it's, you know, the turnout is really, um, it's nice to see um, that these meetings are well attended. So, looking forward to hearing public comment. Okay, Trustee Villalobos. Um, I don't want to take up too much time. I'll just go through it. Um, I also zoomed into the service of love at Cabrillo for um, Valentine's Day. I attended the two board governance workshops over two nights. Um, I was randomly chosen to complete the Pacifica School District Fraud Audit Report. So I did that as well. I reached out to an American Indian advocate regarding um, land acknowledgement um, for the Ohlone, since this is uh, their traditional homelands. And most importantly, I think a lot of my time was responding to parents and their concerns about returning to school. And I'd just like to thank everybody for their comments and sending them to us. Because if we don't hear from you, we really don't know there's an issue. So thank you. Okay. Yeah, when I was in the, the regular, um, regularly scheduled county office of ed phone calls and um, the elected officials for San Mateo County calls, uh, I was lucky to go to the Cabrillo um, third grade Valentine show, which was a lot of fun to see the kids and their artwork and stuff like that. And then also um, Mr. N. Behagen, I attended his uh, musical Zoom that same Friday afternoon. And uh, that was just a lot of fun to see. Oh, to see all the kids, even when they're on Zoom. 
we had the two days of governance um, and then also the Pacifica Coalition meeting with uh, everything that's coming up and all the good work that the different nonprofit organizations are doing even, even during COVID times and on Zoom. And Superintendent Olson, did you have any other communications? Um, I've been mo doing mostly internal other than uh, the collaborative and my head has been buried in uh, uh, spreadsheets. Okay. Well, we're at item 13, presentation, um, LSEA's presentation to celebrate, um, celebration in honor of Patty McNally. And that'll be LSEA President Megan Ellsberg. And I'm being joined hopefully by a few others. You are, we're just moving slowly. Okay, should I wait a second? Please. I'll wait there until I see them all connected. It's just you. Okay. There's Debbie is here. Jonathan. Okay. Hi, Debbie. Got Debbie, Jonathan, Megan. We need Rachel and Natalie. There's Natalie. And there she is. All right. All four. All right. Good evening. My name is Megan Ellsburn, and I am the Laguna Salada Education Association president. Tonight, we are here to honor the wonderful Patty McNally, mentor and friend to hundreds of people in the Pacifica School District and Pacifica community at large. This is just the beginning. When we began to plan how to celebrate Patty, we brainstormed together all of the things she was most passionate about. These words written by Connie T capture Patty perfectly. Patty McNally was the ultimate teammate with her passion and active involvement with her students, staff, family, friends, LSEA, Pacificans Care, and PEF. We hope that you will honor her memory by being a teammate too. Joining me tonight to tell you a bit more about our plans are LSEA bargaining team members, Jonathan Harris, Debbie Little, and Rachel Merlot, along with LSEA's Vice President, Natalie Avenante. We will share with you a bit about how we plan to honor her memory, join her team, and invite you to be on the team too. One of the many things that Patty was passionate about in her classroom was sharing literature with her students. Using picture books and chapter books, Patty would create lessons that elicited emotions and started deep conversations with her students. These lessons would last a lifetime. Patty got many of her treasure books when she traveled to Southern California with her dear friend, Connie. Each year, they would attend a literature conference to gather ideas and collect more great titles for her classroom. Teammates by Peter Gollenbach was one of her all-time favorites. It's the story of Jackie Robinson and the powerful stand his teammate Pee Wee Reese took when Jackie joined the Dodgers in the 1940s. Patty would excitedly tell me every year about the different projects she had her students work on after reading and discussing this book. With Patty's passions in mind, along with the book teammates, our focus for the week is being a passionate teammate and joining Patty's team. One of Patty's passions, Pacificans Care, a lovely local community organization, has purchased a copy of this book for each student in Patty's class. Students received their copy yesterday afternoon from representatives from Pacificans Care and Patty's daughter, Kelly. LSEA leadership and retired members work together to complete a read aloud of this book that our current members can share with their students. We've also placed one copy in each school library and one at the district office. We think retired LSEA members, Connie T, Jan Williams, Fran, Qu excuse me, Cortini, Alice Garibaldi, Pam Moore, Sheila Gamble Dorn, and Maureen Manis for joining us on this project. We thank current LSEA membership, Megan Ellsburn, Jonathan Harris, Debbie Little, Rachel Merlot, Natasha Glasgow, Jennifer Mitchell, Gina Arguello, 
Don Potter, Charlotte Jacobs for lending their voices, and also Natalie Abenante for editing and putting it together. On this slide is a link to the YouTube video with an intro and outro by Connie honoring our friend Patty. We hope you take the time to listen to this story. How can we be teammates to support Patty's passions? LSEA is encouraging everyone in the Pacifica community to join Patty's team during the week, week of March 15th. Why this week? Well, as Patty said many times, there's a reason she was named Patty. Patty's birthday is March 17th. In our classrooms, we will introduce students to lessons about being a teammate and the successes we share when we work together. As a union, we have created a shared Google Drive folder. Members are submitting and sharing lessons with each other to support this theme. One of Patty's passions was supporting her community because her community was her team. One of the ways she supported her community was to support the Pacifica Education Foundation. LSEA has pur purchased four memberships to PEF. Any of our LSEA members who show that they are part of Patty's team will be entered into a raffle to, the be, to be the recipient of one of these memberships. An easy way for all of us to join Patty's team is to participate in our district-wide Teammates Day on Friday, March 19th. We hope to see everyone in our Zoom meetings that day wearing something that represents some sort of team. Our union members will be wearing their union shirts. What will you wear? One idea is to wear your favorite team's colors or jerseys. We know that Patty loved Tim Lincecum and Buster Posey on the Giants. You can't forget Joe Montana or Frank Gore from the Niners either. LSEA does not intend for this to be a one-time event. We want the love, devotion, and hard work that Patty brought to Pacifica to continue to inspire us and our students. Patty cared so deeply and taught others to care by her example. We look forward to being on the March agenda next year to share with you um, our continued plans to honor such an incredible person. Patty did so much for each of us and her passions continue to inspire us. We wanna share that inspiration with all of our students. Our plan is to expand on teammates next year to focus on some of Patty's other passions as well. Next week, please check in on LSEA's social media accounts to see the focus of the day and to enjoy some of Patty's pictures. We hope that you'll honor Patty's memory by being a teammate too. Thank you very much. Well, I think you can pull that down. Uh, and while we are transitioning, I just want to uh, thank the leadership of LSEA for putting that together. I uh, have seen the um, presentation, so I didn't ball uh, when I saw those pictures publicly. But I will tell you, this has been an incredible loss. And when I, I actually, as I was talking to the teachers today, had a hard time not crying. Um, We've been through a lot together uh, in this last year, and this was just an incredible loss. So I thank you for recognizing Patty in the very most positive way that will uh, keep her, her memory and her good parts moving forward. Um, anything else from the trustees? Just thank you all of you, you know, for putting this together and, and her memory. And I am a crier, so I'll stop. <laughs> Okay, without, without, without further ado, let's move on to our next item, which uh, transitions very well in uh, Patty's honor, is that uh, we have been working hard to uh, come to agreement with LSEA around the many, many, many decisions around returning to school, much of them around health and safety. And Patty started with us. Um, we negotiated all summer long. Patty was a big part of our um, return to school task force in the summer. And then uh, as we moved into negotiations, uh, when we got the first uh, one to work in distance learning, and then we just transitioned right into uh, returning to school and have been working on this agreement since October. Um, and we are very thankful and grateful for uh, um, the work that was put into this agreement. It, when things come down to health and safety, they mean a lot. And uh, 
they are often argued against, uh, quite uh, argued on both sides quite passionately, passionately. But it became very clear as we were finishing is that uh, we all wanted to get back to school, and um, and that we do have the kids' best interest in mind. And so I would like to hand this over to Alexis O'Flaherty so that we can present the MOU uh, with LSEA. Thanks, Dr. Olson. I just first want to say what a beautiful tribute to Patty, and thank you, LSEA leadership, for providing that. Um, Patty was a huge part of our, uh, our negotiations, and she is missed. So thank you to everybody for, for uh, providing that beautiful tribute. So I am bringing forth today a signed memorandum under, of understanding that was developed in collaboration with the Pacifica School District and the Laguna Salada Education Association. First and foremost, I would like to thank our LSEA partners for their continued collaboration in reaching an agreement to this MOU regarding reopening schools for the 2020-2021 school year for in-person instruction. PSD and LSEA met several times and developed an MOU which, address, which addresses specific conditions such as implementation of in-person instruction, safety, child care during continuum learning, small cohorts on campus during distance learning, leaves, health screening, testing, notifications, and contact tracing. I again would like to thank LSEA for their partnership during negotiations. It is recommended to the board, uh, it is recommended that the board approve the memorandum of understanding between the Pacifica School District and LSEA regarding reopening schools for the 2020 2021 school year for in person instruction. Okay, do we have any questions uh, regarding the LSEA MOU? Um, Trustee Burkini. No questions, but uh, great work, everybody. Thank you. Okay. Trustee Steele. No questions. And Trustee Villalobos. No questions, but I'd just like to say um, it's a relief that we're moving forward. Okay, do we uh, have a motion to approve the LSEA MOU regarding reopening schools for the 2020-2021 school year? I'll make a motion to approve the MOU um, between LSEA and the Pacifica School District for the 2021 school year. And do I have a second? I'll second the motion. Okay, and Kelly, can you take the roll call vote? Trustee Bredal. Yes. Trustee Burkini. Yes. Trustee Steele. Yes. Trustee Villalobos. Yes. Thank you. The motion passes 4 0. Yeah, the next time I, we um, rearrange the order of the next item. So this will be actually be item C uh, certification of interim financial report 2020 2021. Uh, we have one person that would, shall we wait till after the presentation? Okay, and then we'll have, there's, there is one person that wanted to comment on that. Okay, Ms. Peterson. Thank you, Trustee Budal. Okay, Will is gonna bring up a PowerPoint presentation for our second interim report. Um, I just wanna point out that we do have some other documents on, on the website tonight as well. There is a short memo summarizing um, the second interim report. And then there's a quite large document, which is over 100 pages long, and those are all the state required forms that go along with the second interim report. So if you want to take a look at that um, later as well, there is one document that I'll point out in that report. It's called a um, district certification, and those are the state standards. And um, it's really a summary of what all those 100 plus pages are, and you can easily see um, some of the state's criteria and standards and some of the areas where the district, the district meets those standards and some of the areas where the district does not meet those standards. And then there's explanations as to why the district may not meet those standards. So if anybody has any, if any of the trustees have any questions about that during or after the presentation, I'd be happy to go over that. So if you can go ahead and advance, um, I'm not gonna go through the table of contents, but um, these are all the items we're gonna discuss tonight. So the next slide is really the objective. What is the second interim report? 
Um, we presented the first interim report to the board in November, which covered um, the beginning of the year's activity. And now the second interim report shows the actuals through January 31st, and then a projection of um, the rest of our budget for the remainder of the school year. So tonight you'll see a detailed budget and, along with multi-year projections. So what has changed since the first interim report? Um, first interim, we um, prepared that report based on what the governor's state budget was for the 2021 school year. At that time, um, the projections were zero colas for three years because our report is not only for this current fiscal year, but we must project two years out. So we had based that report with zero colas. For this current school year, we are still facing a 0% cola. Um, there is a typo there where it says difference. It should be zero. There's zero change in this current fiscal year. For the next school year, we had projected a 0% COLA, and now Governor Newsom has um, projected a 3.84% COLA. So that's, that's a, quite a bit of a difference. And then the following year, it went to 2.98%. You can go ahead and advance to the next slide. So... Pacifica School District is what you would call LCFF funded, that's local control funding. We are highly dependent on the state funds um, and there's a calculation, there's a formula for how we are funded. We're funded based on the number of students that come to school, it's called average daily attendance. Um, this year and last year, we were held harmless because of COVID, we really couldn't um, take normal attendance. So we're using the 19 um, prior year attendance at this time. And um, what they did add in, as we've discussed before, is an engagement record um, for students. So I know there was some questions earlier about CARES Act funding. These um, next few slides will go over what we received in the current fiscal year for uh, what you call COVID or CARES Act funding. There is some new funding that you heard on the news, and I can um, talk about that as well. It wasn't it wasn't available when we prepared this, this current PowerPoint. But for the CARES Act funding for this current school year, we, the first um, category of funding that we received was called School Emergency Relief Fund. And that was federal funding um, based on our uh, Title I student counts. And we received 82,000. And this slide breaks down how the funds were spent. This category of funds is, fully, is now fully expended and we have filed all the required federal reports for these funds. The second category is also federal funding. Um, the abbreviation was GEAR and um, those funds have um, started to be spent on supplies and licenses for special ed during distance learning. Um, very little of those funds are spent and we have quite a bit um, more time until June 2021 to spend those funds. You can advance to the next slide. The additional funding is also some federal funding, um, was a million dollars. It was called um, Coronavirus Learning Loss Relief Supplemental Funds. And um, this category has also fully been expended. When we received the funds, um, the federal government was very strict and said it had to be spent by December 31st, 2020, and the reports needed to be filed. So we did that later learning that they extended the deadline. But um, we fully expended these funds and you can see how the funds were spent. Um, uh, the bulk of it was on certificated compensation, distance learning, um, uh, technology, child nutrition, which we talked a lot about at the last presentation. We, um, we have a large loss in child nutrition at this time, it's 600,000. And we use $300,000 of these funds to cover a portion of the loss in the child nutrition fund. And go ahead to the next one. And then the last category was state funding, learning loss mitigation funds, 221,000. Um, and we have not fully expended these funds, but they are fully encumbered on uh, staff compensation at this time. So we hired some custodians, that's classified compensation. And we have purchased additional um, PPE, which you call protective equipment. And then we supported some technology for distance learning. So that covers the current CARES Act funding. Um, I don't know if this is a good time to talk about next year's funding. Is this, Dr. Olson, would you like me to touch base on that or are you covering that in your presentation? Um, I don't 
think I, I went into anything other than uh, Governor Newsom's uh, 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 AB 86 money. Okay. okay, well, that's what I have. I don't have anything okay. additional. So then I'll let you cover that in your presentation. So I'll go on. Um, one of the big issues we've been facing, and we've discussed this a lot, is what's called state deferrals. It's really complicated, but um, to kind of summarize it, when the state's budget is in crisis, they basically just don't pay school districts. So they tell us we can count the money in our budget for this school year, but cash flow wise, they don't pay us. And for this school year, the state has over $12 billion of what they call cash deferrals for school districts. This really only impacts school districts such as Pacifica School District who are highly dependent on state funding. Many of our neighboring school districts who receive a lot of property taxes are not faced with this cash flow issue. So for Pacifica, starting in February, the state stopped paying us our monthly allotment. The total for this year is $7.3 million, which is 36% of our funding. Um, so we've worked very hard this year and we obtained a loan for, um, it's called a TRAN, and we will start receiving those funds in April. And we will carry that loan through July, August. When the state starts to pay us, we'll start to pay back the loan. So here's a summary. It's um, pretty much the same as what we presented at first interim. This is what our uh, general fund revenues look like. And you can really see from this pie chart, LCFF, LCFF sources, 82%. Those are the funds we get from the state for uh, student attendance. And we used to get property taxes, but because of more complicated formulas in San Mateo County, we're no longer receiving a portion of property taxes. We are 100% funded by the state's LCFF um, sources. So 82%, um, and as I mentioned earlier, 36% of our funds are not gonna be paid this year. So that's a, a huge amount of our funds that we are borrowing now and um, paying borrowing costs so that we can um, continue operations through the end of the year. The federal funds are very low at 6%, other state revenues, 6%, and then other local revenues, 6%. And the local revenues include um, grants and PEF and our parcel tax funds. You can go ahead for the next one. So here's a slide of our combined general fund expenditures, and you can see um, the breakdown. And, uh, and there were some questions on this, so I do have another slide coming up to answer those questions. but. When you look at this, 30% um, is for certificated salaries, classified is 11%, administrators 6%, and then employee benefits is 28%. Now what's in employee benefits is um, the health and welfare costs, retiree costs, and also all of your fixed payroll costs that companies pay on behalf of their employees. Um, we have a small amount that goes to books and supplies, other operating expenditures, and then other outgo is a very small amount. That's the cost we pay for county classes. So if you can go to the next slide. What, um, what I did here was the question last time was total employee compensation because the previous chart had employee benefits broken out. So in this slide, we've added the cost of employees, which includes um, pension costs as well. I hadn't mentioned that. We pay for um, what's called STRS for teachers and PERS for classified, but we pay the pension costs, um, which are retirement um, benefits, and then we pay for health and welfare costs and um, fixed payroll costs. And so now the percentages include all of the costs of um, our employees. So it's 48% for certificated, classified is 19%, administration is 9%, and then you have the other categories of our budget. So I hope this answers, um, I know I had some questions from trustees in the last presentation. You can go ahead. Okay, now this might be hard for you to read, but this is um, the summary of our current budget. So the first column is the first interim, which we presented in November. And then the second column is uh, our second interim. And so what I wanted to show you here is the changes from first interim to second interim. And so I have it on my screen here, but you can see, for example, in um, the last column A, there's a $32,000 difference. 
And what that is, is um, the LCFF revenues increase slightly um, based on the final CDE attendance numbers. And the, um, the next page goes over all of this in detail. Um, let's see if there's some we should point out that, for example, in um, B, the federal and state revenues increased because of learning loss funds that we um, received after first interim. So that's how you read that chart. Um, the other change here is towards the middle of the bottom is transfers in. We had in first interim put, uh, put in a transfer from fund 17 of 625,000. And so um, there was some unassigned ending fund balance at the bottom, which was a question. So now what we've reflected here is exactly 3% in the general fund and reduced that transfer. So that's how you read this chart. If you go to the next page, Will, um, you can see a description of all the changes that happened from the first interim to the second interim. So for example, H, there was uh, COVID expenditures for technology, uh, personal protective equipment, cleaning and disinfecting. Um, so that's basically all of the changes um, in this report. We can go on. And please, trustees, if you have questions, um, I can stop or we can ask them at the end and we can go back to the slides that you have questions about. So multi-year assumptions, again, this is a big um, thing in the interim reports is you have to do the first year and then uh, two years going out. So here's a summary of the governor's January proposal. And then what I have on here as well is school services estimates because um, school services is being a little more conservative with the, the two um, out years, and you can see it in red, they're projecting uh, lower COLAs. And so as we go into the multi-year, I did prepare two different scenarios for you, one with the governor's January proposal, and then one with what school services is currently estimating. Um, the county direction for this report is to use the governor's proposal. So that is what we have used. Um, if we do use the lower colas, you'll see in the multi-year, then it does become very difficult for Pacifica. The next time we'll know um, what the projections are is the May revision on May 15th. And you could easily see these projections change again for the, the subsequent fiscal years. So we can go ahead. Um, what These are assumptions that are in, included in the 21-22, because when we prepare our report, we have to reflect two years out and project changes. And so these are really, um, most of them have already occurred, and some of them occur naturally with when we do staffing. And I know um, Dr. Olson did add a slide on the um, staffing to enrollment, and so I won't get into too much about that, but it's basically... Um, when we looked at our enrollment over the years, and this year with COVID, we did add some teachers because of distance learning. And she'll go into more detail on that. Child nutrition, we've had um, two or three staff members retire or leave um, the state. And so there's been some savings there. We have not filled any of the vacant positions because currently we're just not serving all of the students of Pacifica and we don't need to have that many staff hours when we're only serving two days a week. And our, our meal counts are very low right now. Transportation, we had some van drivers. We had one um, bus driver that retired and then another van driver took a promotion in our district. Uh, maintenance, we had a lead senior maintenance retire and the replacement is costing less because he was a very senior employee. And then we're looking at shifting how the sites receive their funds because um, currently it's in base and we're looking at shifting that towards um, supplemental funds so we can target the students in supplemental funds. So the total projection that's included in this report is $660,000. Go, go ahead and move forward. I'm gonna actually just carry on from that one if I may, if we could stay on that back slide right there, the last one, please. Um, so the reduction in the site SIPSA-based allocations, and just providing a little bit of background is that um, of our six sites, uh, uh, school sites, uh, five of them have a carryover budget of over $100,000. 
and the uh, the SIPSA allocation is approximately it's a, a per student uh, amount approximately thirty five thousand per um, between thirty five to forty about forty thousand per school and so our thinking is is that um, because of uh, the way that some of the uh, COVID funding will uh, come in, as we talk about in the return to school plan, uh, that there will be more money to serve students in uh, additional ways after school, additional hours, uh, interventions, is that it makes sense at this point. Um, number one, a conservative piece is just not um, provide that uh, next year's amount, uh, SIPSA base amount, but the, uh, the uh, carryover would remain. And so those five schools with $100,000 would spend from there. It really is the intention if we provide money for a school site, they, they, you know, as much as possible to spend that money within a school year. However, in Pacifica, everyone always knows that there's a rainy day and uh, saving for a rainy day, but also because of last year, and not all of that money was spent. And then in terms of the, the, the sixth school that well, um, does not have a significant carryover is we will provide an equal, uh, not $100,000, but we would provide a, a working budget for that school. Next slide, please. So this one is just, a, I've, I really struggled with how to show this, but, um, but with uh, uh, the advent of distance learning, um, we added, uh, we have 20 uh, teachers that are uh, full year distance learning teachers. And so uh, we hired a number of those teachers at the beginning of the year, but I just wanted to show how our enrollment has uh, gone down and our staffing has gone up. And so if we look at it from a five-year perspective, is uh, the blue bar is our uh, certificated staffing. So in 2016-17, we had 153 and a half teachers. Um, this year we have 158.1 uh, uh, teachers. And so our staffing is as high as it's been in a while but yet our enrollment is uh, is down slightly. And so um, just to show you that number, um, our, our enrollment at this point in 2016-2017, um, it was uh, 3,149, and then it kind of leveled off. Um, we actually thought it was going to be quite consistent uh, prior to the pandemic, and it did go down. I think a lot of people have left the Bay Area. Um, and uh, the other piece to keep in mind is that our enrollment for next year is also, um, we're not quite certain what that is. A, a fair number have uh, declared on the most recent survey, uh, probably about 15% have said that they're not sure that they're returning to the Pacifica School District. I understand that a fair amount of that is uh, looking at what, what uh, instruction or services are provided next year, but at this time for next year, our enrollment is as unclear as any. So just to make sure that everybody understands what this graph is, is that the blue lines are the certificated staffing and the orange lines are the enrollment. And so we have about 150 students less than this year. Uh, I was asked about kindergarten enrollment. It is a little uh, lower this year. I expect that probably in August, it will be close to about the same. Um, but as we were doing our kindergarten lottery, um, you know, many, many families were not uh, not sure what they were doing. So. so for that is the reason why we feel quite comfortable that we could uh, that we could go with seven less teachers than last year. Um, really, if we look at um, in the last uh, several years that our uh, enrollment ratio was between 20, uh, 20 uh, and 20 and a half students to each teacher. Um, and so right now we're at 19 uh, students per teacher. And so there is room in there for reduction of anywhere between seven and 12 teachers. And we're just keeping the most conservative, um, conservative line on that is that it makes sense to look at a seven teacher reduction. Next slide. Okay, thank you. So the next two slides is a summary of our current 2021 budget. 
And then as required, we are projecting two fiscal years out. So this, this um, current slide shows you what the governor's current COLA projection is, 3.84% in year two and 2.98% in year three. So again, the first column is 2021, and it shows you um, what our projections are for this year. And then at the very bottom, it shows you what our reserve calculations are, because that is the, the most crucial part for us is to maintain a 3% reserve and hopefully a little bit higher in order to maintain cash flow. Now, what I added here, because there was some questions in the last presentation about our, what is our, our true reserve. I know the auditors presented a report um, in the last um, same time we did the first interim, or maybe it was in January. And in our 1920 audit report, our reserves were higher. Um, that was last school year. We had over 7%. And because we're deficit spending, what we're doing is we're um, spending ongoing expenditures with one-time funds. So we're using our reserves right now to balance our budget um, in, in the last two fiscal years. And so that's why there was a big difference between when the auditor presented his report was for last year over 7%. And now we're looking at 2021. So we're looking at two years of deficit spending. Our reserve has gone down now to just um, just under 4.5 percent for the 2021 school year, and that's everything we have in the general fund, and also what we have in Fund 17. And you can see that at the bottom of the slide. Then going forward to 21-22, when you add a 3.84 percent cola versus what we had projected at first interim of zero percent cola, um, the budget does look better, and you can see that we still maintain a reserve of. 5.95% in total, and then carrying it forward with a 2.98% COLA in the following fiscal year, um, we still maintain over a 5% reserve. Now, how we've done our multi-year projections, we did include the budget reductions that were in the previous slide, and we also have to include um, increased costs to the district. We still have increased costs, increased employee cons compensation, as employees move up in their salary schedule, what's called step and column, we have to include that in our projections. And also as we have to project what budget um, for health and welfare costs are. And historically, you can see Kaiser rates about 5% increase. Um, and that we also pay for the dental and we pay for the pensions and retiree costs. So those increases are also built into our budget. There's also an increase built in for special education and the normal operations of the district. Um, so it, with this scenario, we do maintain our 3% reserve and then some, and then um, we're able to file a positive certification. The last time we looked at this with you, we had what's called a qualified certification because we showed that we could not maintain a 3% reserve in the, in the two subsequent years. And that the main difference here is really that now the governor is projecting a COLA. So Will, if you can go to the next slide. We just wanted to show you what, um, what a difference this COLA makes for us because we're so dependent on state funding. The school services is projecting lower COLAs in year two. And then we, I carried this out one year further so that you could see what happens in the 20, 324 school year. So with school services projections, um, we still maintain our 3% in the 22-23 school year, but then with a 1.61% COLA in year four, we do drop to a negative. We, can, we have less, we, we don't even maintain a positive cash flow. So this is just um, to show you how, you know, it could change when we have the main revision. If the COLAs don't come in as projected, we could be looking at a much lower reserve um, depending on what the governor's may revise is. So we really need to be careful as we move forward and, and fiscally prudent um, and try to maintain as, mu as much reserve as we can given the circumstances that we are under at this time. So you can go ahead to the next slide. Um, this is a school services chart which just reflects statewide what district reserves are. They compile this every year and it's always a couple years behind. So they're looking at 2018-19 and what their um, average reserves are for elementary school districts is over 20%. Um, they do recommend and um, the finance office also recommends that districts maintain two months of expenditures for their reserve or a 17% 
And for Pacifica School District, um, two months of operating expenditures is $6 million, 17%. Um, currently, we're at 4.47%. So we're very far off from what the rec recommendations are. The recommendations are um, higher reserves because things do happen, unanticipated things. For example, when we adopted our budget this year, we didn't anticipate that the state, the state was not going to pay us from February to June. So we have negative cash flow and had to go out and, and borrow funds and, and, and incur borrowing costs. So um, I think the next slide goes over the recommendations for reserves. Um, it's also in the county letter for first interim, as Dr. Olson mentioned, that she's going to post that on our website. The county does strongly recommend that you maintain higher than 3% reserves, and um, they, they're looking carefully at our cash flows. Our cash flows are included in um, all the documents attached, and you can see the months when Pacifica has negative cash flows and incurs borrowing costs. So we can go ahead and move forward. Okay, this is a summary of all the funds just so you have the full picture. Um, the general fund is really what we focus on. Um, child nutrition this year has been very difficult because we um, maintained all of our operating costs, but we're just not serving the same amount of meals as we used to. Um, we are giving out free meals to all students, but our, our, our lunch counts are very low. And then deferred maintenance is the third category. The state used to fund deferred maintenance, and deferred maintenance is your, your fix-it things, like your, your roof patching, your asphalt patching, fencing, all the things you need to fix in schools. Um, the state no longer funds this, so we are just using $40,000 from the general fund each year, and that's not, not covering very many repairs, but that's pretty much what we have for now. And then Fund 17 is the Special Reserve Fund, you can see the transfer going out to the general fund, and then you can see the ending balance, the 473,000, which is included in our reserves. And special reserve fund 20, what that is, is um, it pays for our retiree benefit health, um, health and dental costs. And we do what you call a pay as you go. So each year we pay for, we have about 170 retirees. We pay for those costs um, for up to 10 years for our retirees. And um, the recommendation is that you have enough in that fund to uh, cover all of your current retirees, which um, when you do a study is over $10 million. What we're keeping in that fund is really just enough to get by year to year. And then the building fund is where we deposited bond funds and we did report to the board on our bond activity at um, one of the previous board meetings. And then capital facilities fund is, um, it's what you call developer fees. When people do construction in Pacifica, they file a permit with the city planning and then the Jefferson High School District collects a fee and we share in that fee. These funds, um, we have just under 600,000 are highly restricted funds. And what we're going to use those funds are is to match with our bond fund and use in areas when there's enrollment growth or growth in schools. For example, um, some of the construction projects that we're looking at, we're looking at using those funds as matching funds. And then the last category is special reserve um, fund cap uh, 40. And that is um, where you would deposit facilities fees revenues. And also what we have in there is our sale of site funds. We sold an old school site a few years ago and we're using those funds to do the workforce housing project. So that's a summary of all the funds. We can go on. So the certification, um, we are now self-certifying as positive. In first interim, we certified as qualified, which means um, you may not meet your, your, um, your, your financial obligations for the current year or two subsequent years. Now we're saying that we will, and the county will review this, and um, then they'll issue another letter. Now, they did concur with our qualified certification the last time, and um, they issued that letter. So that would be something that I would recommend everybody take a look at when they have time. And then go on. So county oversight, because we were qualified, this year we've been under county oversight, which means we've had some additional requirements We've been giving them some um, status updates and reports, 
and um, they've been reviewing all of our um, financial reports as we move forward. So now based on the governor's higher uh, COLA projections, we're gonna file for a positive report and hopefully be out of the, out of the county oversight program. So what are the next steps? Um, we're gonna continue looking at our enrollment and staffing. We um, will take actions on, on budget reductions. And then um, in May, we'll look for the governor's May revise. Um, we are preparing an LCAP, which is our local control accountability plan, which um, we heard a lot of in the last few years, but we haven't um, spent a lot of time on it this year. But it is still a requirement and um, we'll have a public hearing and then an adoption. And I don't know if I have the exact dates of those board meetings, but it's in May um, is when we'll have our public hearing. I think there's just a couple additional slides um, for information. We had some questions last time. So uh, one of them was our parcel tax report. And um, we did have our parcel tax committee issue. We met and they issued the report, but here's a summary of where our parcel tax funds are. We um, had some carryover from 2019-20 and then what we're projecting to receive this year. So it's about 1.4 million and uh, a large portion of that goes to fund teacher positions. And then teacher support is um, what was formerly called the BITSA program, counseling for the um, across the school district and uh, four hours of a library media technician in all of our schools. And then outdoor education. Unfortunately, our, our fifth graders were not able to go to outdoor education. So what um, we've talked about doing is reserving those funds in the hopes that both the fifth and sixth graders can attend outdoor education next year and then our school gardens. So we're projecting to have um, still an ending fund balance of about 125,000. The one thing about these funds is they are one-time funds. So as um, we plan for expending one-time funds, we always look to uh, a program or some kind of um, program that is a one-time expenditure because we wouldn't be able to continue that um, going forward if we spend all of the one-time funds on ongoing expenditures. And then we have one more summary slide and it's um, basically the same. It's moving very slowly. The workforce housing project has been in the city planning department pretty much for this school year. Um, we've gone back and forth with questions and answers and um, we're waiting to hear from city planning. But the project is um, still the same. In the end, it would generate a positive cash flow for the district and um, be able to provide housing for our staff. I think that is the presentation. So I'm happy now to answer questions that trustees have, go back to some slides or um, answer any other questions about the attachments. Okay, Josie, Josie, we have two people that want to comment, do public comment first before we have discussion. Okay. Can I just add a, just a couple things onto this is that um, uh, when we met in a board work study, um, we did not know uh, what the governor's budget was and uh, we're not certain what it is until May, but we do believe that we're going to be um, lifted a bit by those one-time monies that will be provided by both the state and the federal government. Um, so it will get us into next year, but it doesn't fix our structural problem, which is that we spend more than we bring in. And so um, because our um, immediate focus is on returning students to school and preparing for next year, um, we're um, just making the reductions that we need to to become um, a positive certification. And that next year, what we propose is uh, in order to get stakeholder buy-in is just a, a small team not a uh, return to school task force size team of 50, but a small size team of like say 10 to 12, um, which would include parents, uh, LSEA members, CSEA members, uh, community members, and really study our budget. And just uh, like uh, President Sayers of CSEA asked for is looking for ways to reduce costs, ways to bring in additional revenues, and ways to, uh, to look at fixing the deficit spending that we have. Um, those state defer deferrals that uh, Ms. Peterson spoke about impact our district greatly. Um, and we were hoping that with uh, some of the state money that perhaps that would have been taken care of this year, but it, it was not. Um, that impacts a district like us because 
while we ha while we borrow the money, there is a cost to borrowing that money. Um, and then I will uh, talk about the impact of our budget on um, on COVID and COVID response in the COVID presentation. So why don't we take the speakers and um, then we can do board discussion. Okay, if we can remove that slide um, so that they can see everyone in gallery view. And, and I think the first one was Jesse Lang. Sorry, I was trying to go for the uh, return to school comment. Perfect. Oh, we'll put you back there. Okay, all right. <laughs> we'll switch Thank you. you. And then I think the other one was uh, Michelle Fertel. Mm -hmm. I wonder if Michelle has a different name. It says Michelle Frutel, but no space in between. Anybody see her in the participant list? Uh, it, is it just under an M now? Let's see. look under the Fs. Um, looks, looks like she put in a question in the Q&A, but under just an M. So we don't answer questions that are in the question and answer. If you'd like to come and uh, make a uh, public comment, it may be included in the discussion. Look for her here. Okay, I do see the M on the attendees list. Is there any way we can bring her up? Sure. There we go. Okay, Michelle, we got you. <laughs> and the three oh. minutes off. Uh, sorry, I uh, I just pressed someone else. Let, let me go. Uh... Okay, Michelle. If you, Michelle, if you can unmute and you'll have three minutes. Elizabeth, I believe that's a different Michelle or a different M because it's a lowercase M we're looking for, not an uppercase M in the little box. Uh, well, the question was put into the Q&A with a capital M, so about the budget. So does the capital M like to speak? Okay, um, I guess we don't have any comment, any comments on the budget. So I cannot find her. Yeah, the capital M was the only one. Okay, I guess we'll... Let's move to board discussion. And would you like me to go around um, and call people for questions in order or? Trustee Burkini, did you have any comments? Um, yeah, I have a couple of questions. Um, let's see, to the teachers that um, I just want to reiterate, are those were teachers that were hired for full year distance learning? Um, is that the case? Could you clarify that? Um, I, I actually, uh, 
they are uh, teachers that are temporary teachers at this point. They were hired as temporary teachers. Um, so typically in a school uh, district that uh, you have to, um, when you hire, you have to make sure that you have spots for any teachers that are on leave. Um, and so they are, uh, there are also um, teachers that are in job share situations or, um, uh, I, I'll actually defer to Alexis on answering that one. Yes, yeah, so our temporary teachers, um, like Dr. Olson was saying, is that um, each school year we release um, employees from the district with temporary status due to being part-time or not fully credentialed or in an assignment for a permanent member teacher who's on leave. Um, so we do tonight, one of the re resolutions that will be coming to you will be to, um, I'm recommending to uh, approve the uh, resolution to um, release these uh, temporary teachers. Okay. Did we answer um, your question? Did we yeah. answer your question? Okay. I think so. Thank you. Um, then I had, I was glad again to see, and it came up in a meeting I was in about outdoor ed for the fifth graders that that will carry over to next year if possible. So glad to see that. Um, I did have a question way back when on one of, I think the second CARES slide, Josie made mention that there's a good amount of money left in that particular bucket. It was the one that had to be spent by June, 2021. I was just curious what we can spend that on and what the plans are to try to maximize that. Thank you, Trustee Brocchini, that's a good question. Um, it did say 2021, but that is the special ed category of the CARES Act, and it, and it really, um, things have changed, it's 2022. And we've received a very um, specific list from the county um, and Jeanette at the county office of how those funds, um, there's different categories of how they could be funded. it's very specific. And I know that our special ed department is working on um, on expending those funds. Um, part of it did have to go to um, what you call the private school allocation because there are students in Pacifica that attend private schools. And when you receive federal funding like Title I and um, these special CARES Act funding, there is a formula and an allocation where you allocate some of the funds or services to the private schools. And I know that portion has um, been expended and they are working on um, spending it on the needs of the special ed students. And it is, we do have more time to spend those funds. Linda, you're muted if you hear anything else. Okay, uh, no, that was all I had. So thank you very much for the clar clarification. Okay, um, Trustee Steele, did you have any questions? Um, I mean, nothing concrete. At the, it was just a lot to take in. So no, uh, I won't uh, derail this anymore on my end. Okay, Trustee Villalobos. Okay, um, I liked um, Superintendent Olson's slide on the teachers and enrollment, you know, showing the decline in enrollment. I wish I would have seen our baseline of teachers though, where we should be versus where we were and where we're at, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering if you could give us an idea of where we should be on that slide, where the where the lines are. Um, that was my first question. And then the other one is I just wanted to remind everybody um, who's here that our parcel tax will be sunsetting in, I think it was 2024 or 2025. And on our parcel tax, we pay for seven teachers there. And so we really need to start looking at where we're going to fit those additional seven teachers that we're paying with the parcel tax right now or begin thinking about another parcel tax so that we don't get hit with any 
surprises when we get there that we need to start planning for it now. Uh, the other, I think that was it, but I would just like to see the baseline of where the teachers, where we should be with our, with that, um, versus the enrollment. Yeah. Um, that actually is one of the reasons why it was so hard to make that chart is because if we look at, at, if you want to call where we should be, if we want to make it as cost effective as possible, is it would be at 24 to one in the uh, TK to uh, three and 32 in the four to eight. But I can assure you that uh, kids don't come in perfectly neat packages in that area. And um, and so that's kind of the, the trick is how many are at each school and each grade level. And then those kids do typically move up together as a group, um, but it is hard to track. And during pandemic time, it's even harder on that. And so I can do our, our best in terms of calculation. When you do the pure on like district wide calculation, we could do with many, many, many fewer teachers, um, but that just isn't realistic in terms of uh, ballpark. And so you just have to kind of, it, it's more of a like in general what happens. So I, I will try to get you that information in the future. Um, and then uh, your second question was around the parcel tax. I think um, uh, I hear often from uh, folks around an in interest in looking at what the next phase of, first of all, uh, making sure that we, when that parcel tax expires is that we have at least that, but also uh, districts in the Bay Area have uh, done some interesting things with parcel taxes and you are seeing more and more parcel taxes that are looking at going to employee revenue. Uh, or employee um, uh, employee uh, wages, um, and it's in the Bay Area. We all know how expensive it is to live, and yet our revenue um, as a school district is very limited. And so you've seen school districts like San Mateo Foster City. Uh, I just paid my uh, property tax bill in San Francisco, and a substantial amount of money in that tax um, in that property tax bill. Uh, is an additional uh, parcel tax for funding teacher uh, income, teacher raises or staff raises. And my last comment is on the um, committee bringing different um, people together, LSEA, CSEA, parents, community members. Um, I would, when we do that, I would like to put that parcel tax equation in there because I think it's very important. Mm -hmm. um, and do we have an idea of when we will bring it, be making that committee? To me, I think uh, uh, looking at that work happening October through January of next year, um, getting well into the start of next school year, and then uh, looking at that committee October to January. Thank you. I think Trustee Steele had another question. Yeah, uh, just based off what you just said, Dr. Olson, with the, so that new, if we were to create a new parcel tax, could you dictate that the funds from that parcel tax only go to like salaries of, you know, classroom teachers or the, you know, classified employees, like rather than other projects within the district? So when we write it up, it like all the funds go directly to their pocket rather than, you know, any other thing? Um, you can do that. Um, typically, it's very difficult to pass something that is um, that is only uh, to support salaries. Um, so what you have to do uh, in order to get uh, most parcel taxes is you have to uh, put enough things on there that's going to interest a wide group of people. And there are many people that would be against paying for um, for salary raises. Uh, even in Pacifica that would just say, nope, that's why I pay taxes. Um, so you, when you're building that, you're also going to look at some other things. Oh, yes, I agree. I think that technology is really important or, you know, gardens are important. So it, you're basically trying to build your constituency around what would pass on that. And while, you know, many, many parents in our district would probably pass a, a salary only um, parcel tax, it would be a risky kind of political move to do only that. Okay, I guess my only reserve with that is, you know, if we do put in the legwork to 
you know, get a parcel tax passed and up and running. And if there are other things, you know, how much of that, you know, are the actual employees going to see? Um, that's just the, that first thought that comes to mind. Um, yeah. Yeah. But and in our last meeting, I think you both uh, or you all uh, uh, were presented with reports from the bond oversight committee and the parcel oversight t committee. And so after the parcel tax is written, um, then it gets spent. And then there's a committee that reviews that it was spent in the way that it was intended that it was written. And so it's just kind of some oversight outside of the district for that. Makes sense. Okay, and then I just wanted to confirm that um, in reducing to enrollment, the, the teachers to enrollment, um, a lot of that can be done um, by normal attrition that, that any that might be leaving the area, retiring, or leaving for any personal reason, um, that that would go towards those seven positions. Um, I, I, uh, I suspect that uh, toward the end of the year that uh, by the number of people that announce their retirements and are announced that they are leaving, that uh, it will be probably close to seven. Um, but at this time, uh, one of the actions that we're going to ask you take, to take, not in this uh, board item, but in, a, in uh, one of the future ones is a, a re, uh, resolution around uh, reducing positions. So, and those are current employees that hold that job. So right now it is current employees. It may very well end up being by attrition. Okay, and then we need to go ahead and, um, and vote on this item if, unless there's any other questions or discussion. Okay, um, do I have a motion to approve um, the second interim financial report? I'll make a motion to approve the second interim, what was the wording you used? Financial report for okay. 2021. Okay, do I have a second? I'll second it. Okay, Kelly, can you take a roll vote? Trustee Bradal. Yes. Trustee Burkini. Trustee Steele. Yes. Trustee Villalobos. Yes. Thank you. The motion passes 4 0. Okay, we're going to go to item um, 14B, the COVID um, 19 and return to school update. So what we're going to do, I think we're going to have the presentation first, and then I will go through and call the, the people who put their names into the Q&A for a comment after the presentation, because the presentation might answer a lot of their questions. Okay, is that Dr. Olson? Or? It is, and I'm waiting for Mr. Lucy to put up the presentation. I don't have it in slides, uh, Dr. Olson, but oh. so I don't think it was shared with me, but I can oh, put it in PDF if you want. Oh, sure. PDF is fine. Okay. So I will, I'll get us started while he's putting that up. As, uh, as we get ready for tonight's presentation, um, we're going to start out with, uh, it is our uh, intention to give you updates on return to in-person instruction every three weeks, moving at a pace. We make, um, we make pretty uh, uh, things change from time to time, and uh, three weeks, that there are a lot of changes that happen, so I'll still wait till I'll... But tonight, what I'd like to talk about are just updates on return to in-person instruction, discuss uh, potential timelines, but not name a timeline in terms of where we are, um, and provide information on the AB86 uh, funding, uh, in-person instruction, and expanded uh, learning grants. I'm going to share this presentation with you. Not up there. I thought it. I'm showing that I'm sharing it. Is it there? You, no, we just see your desktop. Oh. I'm going to turn my camera off so that I can. I'll try it again. Hold on. Sorry about that. I 
it's showing you had it up there being shared actually you know what i can share my screen right yeah, you can. For some reason, I'm having problems. It's showing that it's up there, but it's not up there. Okay. Uh, who can share? Only the host. Yeah, let me let me let me stop sharing here, and then okay. you, you can do it. All right. I'm I'm not sharing now. Okay. Let me see if I can share. Sorry about this delay. I don't I don't have enough bandwidth to share. Um, let me try it. Let me try it again. So it's nine o'clock. Um, might I propose that we take a quick five minute break uh, while we get that presentation up? Would that be okay? Uh, yes. Okay. okay. Let's, uh, Alexis, do you mind starting that five minute timer? Yes, they will. Up now? Yep. Is it up now? No, it's because Heather Olson is sharing, is starting to share her screen. Oh, oh. there it goes. But, I don't know whose screen that is. But now we've got Will Lucy's screen. Perfect. Yeah, is, that, is that it? Can you see my cursor moving around? Yes, I'm afraid that I just gave everybody a five minute break though. <laughs> sorry, sorry about that, Heather. I just, oh, for no, some don't reason. worry about it. I'll be right back. Dr. Olson, you're on mute. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so thank you for uh, your patience while we fixed our technical problems. Um, I'm going to uh, move through the slides, Will, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, we want to give updates on where we are and return to in-person instruction, uh, discuss potential timelines, and then discuss the AB86 money. There are a lot of details in here. Many of the things that were brought up uh, uh, around uh, promotion ceremonies and others, I think, will be addressed tonight as well. So if you could go to current tier assignments uh, on March 2nd. Um, so this was for last week. I actually didn't put in this uh, this next week. Um, we are in the red uh, tier, but it's very likely with the way that the numbers are going uh, that we will be moving into the orange tier next week. Will, are you moving the slides? Yeah, are they moving? I'm moving no, them. They're not no. moving. All right, tell me if I'm moving them now. There you go. Now you're moving them. There we go. Okay, there's our red slide. Okay, I'd like to uh, give an update on this. Um, so, so we are uh, in red at this point, uh, and um, we have accomplished uh, two major things. If you wouldn't mind going to the next uh, slide on staff vaccination update. So, um, for uh, folks that um, are uh, our uh, parents, one of the things that uh, our board decided in our reopening plan um, was to um, wait until all staff have had the opportunity uh, to have the uh, vaccination, both the first dose and the second dose, uh, and for a period of time uh, for that to uh, build into full immunity. That is a part of our MOU with LSEA. Um, it is a conservative uh, uh, standpoint. It isn't the most um, 
upfront in terms of what we can do based on guidance, but it is was the decision that uh, that we made, and we have made tremendous progress in this area. So, in terms of being uh, able to uh, return to school, we've had two accomplishments. Uh, number one is the agreement with the uh, teachers association around returning to school, and uh, the second one is around uh, staff vaccinations. And so, I am happy to report at this point, uh, ninety. 3% of our staff have either received their vaccine or have an appointment in the very near future around that uh, first vaccine. There are approximately 25 more people uh, that need to be vaccinated and um, it is not uh, uh, easy to do necessarily uh, in terms of uh, getting that moving, but that level of people making those appointments, uh, a huge part of that had to do with the aggressiveness of our staff during our February break. Uh, they took on a really big chunk of that and uh, were reporting right away that people received uh, vaccinations, uh, whether that was through the Coliseum, uh, Moscone, um, and so uh, that was a great start to that. Um, on February 2nd, uh, the county, San Mateo County, opened vaccines for educators and prioritized that. Uh, that was a lot of stopping and starting. And uh, uh, people signed up for appointments that weren't really theirs. And uh, everybody was so excited about appointments, they shared it broadly. And, uh, and so then a number of appointments were canceled. Again, people continue to work uh, uh, to get appointments. Um, again, many of them going to the Coliseum, going to San Mateo County events. Um, we've been working very, very closely with San Mateo County around uh, making sure that our staff had access to uh, the vaccine. And so we feel really good about the progress that we've made and that um, will allow us to um, move forward with a little bit more certainty in terms of uh, being able to set a date. So the next stage in this is that I would meet with uh, the LSEA president, Megan Ellsberg, and take a look at those uh, the needed vaccines and uh, discuss a date to start. But I also will include uh, President Nicole Sayers as well. Um, our classified staff have been on the front lines uh, since the beginning of this pandemic. And if I need to just give a couple of shout outs to folks that have contributed to that 93% rate is that uh, if I had to call out a, a department, the child nutrition department are all on their way, the first uh, department to be completed vaccinated, um, not completely vaccinated, but to have everyone have their first dose on that end. Um, and then as well, the school secretaries have been really helpful in terms of making sure that people knew about appointments and making sure about knowing when to get appointments and then helping me uh, uh, keep my list current. And so Kelly Elves and I have been uh, updating. We have a spreadsheet. We are keeping track of people's uh, second appointment. And uh, so um, I wrote this on Friday and, uh, you know, that was 200 and we've made at least 275 in the last week. So, um, or we've made 75 additional, uh, ones. So we're super excited about that. And, um, what I can say is that with this decision to uh, have the staff vaccinated is that I do expect, uh, staff to return, uh, um, uh, they're, fully, right? So I expect that we won't have people um, requesting leaves or that uh, that the classrooms would uh, remain, would not uh, have teachers in them. That's a really important piece of that. And I think as a part of both our agreement and the board's decision is that we can come back uh, and uh, staff can feel uh, safe. So next item. So when we talk about the hybrid um, learning schedule, there are a couple things that I do uh, want to address is that um, this is something that we've been talking about almost since the summer. And uh, there's the um, early on, we talked about the AABB days um, when it appeared as though uh, we would be uh, um, that more staff would be vaccinated. We did look at doing a morning and afternoon uh, 
um, block so that kids could come to school either four or five days a week, and but it would be for a shorter period of time. And uh, it was just determined, uh, uh, even though we do have additional custodial support, that uh, the amount of time each day was um, two and a half hours, and that two and a half hours, uh, four days a week versus coming for a uh, full block uh, two days a week was uh, um, going to be more ideal just in terms of uh, making sure that the classrooms were cleaned between uh, the groups and just in terms of convenience or inconvenience. And we recognize that a hybrid is a difficult learning schedule and it, it it's just difficult for parents. It's difficult. Uh, it's difficult to manage, and so we tried to pick the the best scenario, and that was kids being at school for that for that block of time that they would be at school, and that they they would not go home and do any asynchronous learning. Um, and then another piece of our uh, MO, MOU with LSEA is that on the days that students are not with the teacher. Um, that there is going to be, uh, that that teacher, uh, he uh, will meet with students for approximately 30 minutes on asynchronous days, um, so that there will at least be some connection with the teacher every day. Um, so, next slide. So, another uh, big piece of work uh, that needed to be done and that is very challenging is at Ingrid B. Lacey, um, Schools struggle with um, stable groups for middle schools, comprehensive middle schools and comprehensive high schools. And um, a big part of that is how many exposures or how, how much interaction should kids have and with how many students should they have that. Um, and so uh, this past week, uh, Dan Little met with the principal of Hillsborough, Hillsborough Taylor Middle School, uh, Maria Brady, and uh, talked about their program and how they are able to provide um, a comprehensive middle school-like program um, in, uh, in their setting. And so the learning block um, is uh, the way that they would look at that. Um, so I actually think I have this incorrect. Um, I have it for a draft group for A, but right now the A team is at home. And so this would be for B. So if we looked at Thursday and Friday, and we look at those, for, the student has six periods, they would have three periods on Thursday and three periods on Friday. Um, and so uh, what that does is limit a student's contact to less than 50 students. Um, so part of it is safety for the student. The second part of that is if there is a positive case at a school or a close contact is being able to contain that to only 50 students as opposed to contact tracing through the entire school. Next slide, please. So when we think about returning to school, you've heard about many times uh, the multiple la layers of uh, safety, uh, otherwise known in San Mateo County uh, Office of Ed is the four, uh, the four pillars. So stable groups and limited gatherings, and that is where we um, get to uh, the guidance that we're under right now. And so uh, people ask, there are multiple sources of guidance, and so I just wanna uh, be clear with uh, who we take guidance from. And so as a school district in San Mateo County, our guidance comes from San Mateo uh, County Health Office. Um, and um, so Dr. Morrow and Dr. Morrow's office issues the orders uh, and sets the guidance for San Mateo County Health. Um, California Department of Public Health is also another source of guidance for, um, for the district. And they recently in January submitted uh, new guidance. Um, and then there are other layers of guidance, but that are uh, not direct, that are advisory, but not directly issuing the orders around which schools follow. So uh, Center for Disease Control. Um, so as you look at this, some of the things that come out is that that physical distancing of six feet is still in order right now as we return to school. 
Um, there are other places where it says that it can be less than six feet. So in, Cal uh, in San Mateo County, uh, six feet is still the expectation and the order. Um, the California Department of Health says uh, six feet if you can, if you need to make adjustments, uh, that you can make adjustments, but never less than four. And then uh, Cal uh, Center for Dis Disease Control is looking at less than six feet. So. What I will just say in terms of uh, the interactions that we have right now is that we're very dependent on that six feet. I do believe that those orders will change as we move along uh, from San Mateo County. I would expect for next year as we think about a reopening that those numbers, uh, especially as schools reopen safely, that that six feet distance may uh, decrease. And so that is just one of the challenges in front of us is that when, uh, when folks talk about next year or you talk about what a graduation would look like is that we are right now under orders of San Mateo County Health. And I don't wanna hide behind that. I just wanna be realistic about what the, what the requirements are. So in terms of uh, could we hold a graduation at this point right now, we could not because if you think about say 60 students with uh, even if they brought each one only brought two uh, family members, that would be 180 and then you add the staff that's 200. Um, in a school gathering, um, we would not do anything like that at this period of time. Um, but what I will tell you is that I really expect there to be guidance from San Mateo County around uh, safe, um, safe promotion and graduation ceremonies. And I think that we can work together to build the very best um, promotion ceremony that was, would be available to each one of our eighth graders. And so um, it's not over. The district has never decided that there's no graduation. Um, that that's, was never our intent, but right now under the orders that we have to follow, we cannot do that. And we would need um, that guidance to change in order to do that. I do believe it can be done safely. I'm 99% sure we'll be looking at some kind of outside uh, promotion ceremony, but we really do have to look at the size of that and we have to look at the orders that we are under at that given time. So because this is something that is affecting all 23 school districts in San Mateo County, I would expect that within the next month or so, we will be hearing additional guidance from uh, San Mateo County. So we talked about all of the other pieces in the past, um, adequate ventilation, hand hygiene, uh, symptom screening, screening, close contact exposure screening, and surveillance screening for staff. Next slide, please. So AB 86 is, uh, is um, uh, compromise. Uh, it's the legislature's proposal for reopening and extending learning proposal. And so uh, the um, expectations around there is uh, offer an in-person instruction to students by April 1st. Um, eligible up to May 1st, but the amounts are in incrementally decreased for each day of instruction between April 1st and May 15th and that they are forfeited if instructions not offered by May 15th. So um, one of the challenges to this is that if we were to change um, our, um, our agreements with our associations around starting is that we would have to reopen negotiations. And so I think we're on a path that we are as close to uh, getting to a reopening as we will in this case. And so we are going to continue to move forward. Next slide, please. Um, and then in addition to the, uh, the money for reopening, there's also expanded learning opportunity grants. Um, and we'll talk specifically about amount, amounts of money um, is that uh, the rules around that are 85% have to be used for in-person instruction, 15% are um, can be used uh, for activities provided remotely. Um, there is a push to employ paraprofessionals um, and that uh, if a district foregoes uh, in-person instruction grant that you still receive some of this expanded learning opportunity grant and um, we will be coming back to you with a plan around the expanded learning opportunity grants um, because that needs to be um, adopted by June 1st. Um, the, the, when you see the amounts of money, uh, let's move to the next slide. One of the things is that when you get an opportunity like this, you don't want to um, 
quick spend it or you don't want to uh, spend it on things that you don't know whether you need or not. And so this is a real opportunity for us. So the LCFF share is what this funding is based on. And so if we look at the full amount of in-person instruction grant, um, that's about $850,000. And so um, we are probably, uh, we will be likely starting school in April. Um, so that's one of the things that I know. And so we will be receiving some of this money um, and uh, we receive money for homeless youth and then about $1.8 million for that expanded learning opportunity. So it could be used for summer school. It could be used to extend the school year. Uh, it could be used to expand next year's school year. It could be used to extend the school day. And like I said before, um, uh, they'd like uh, um, some of that money to be used uh, for paraeducators. Next slide. Um, so when we think about our plan to return to school, um, areas of focus or maybe areas that we have uh, not uh, maybe paid enough attention to is uh, the stable group structures, is that was the piece as the plan was going into the county office where it was really uh, clear to me that uh, IBL needed uh, more stable group structures uh, because of the number of exposures. And um, I will say as a superintendent, uh, when your teachers are advocating for more time with kids and seeing them six periods per day, you love that. Like you absolutely agree with that. Like that, I, you can't argue against that. But part of being able to return to school safely is limiting the amount of exposure those kids have. And I don't think that that's in the long term. I do believe that Mr. Little will be able to put together a master uh, master schedule next next year that will put kids in groups that would naturally um, so that there won't be as much uh, moving around uh, just uh, initially to start school um, and that that would allow us uh, to be able to offer as much in-person instruction as possible. So that stable group structure is really important on that end. Um, the other thing that has become clear as uh, uh, the superintendent's office, myself and Kelly Elves, have been uh, up to our eyeballs in um, uh, vaccination is that we don't have a lot of bandwidth in our team uh, as uh, as a district office team and um, and we have found how um, contact tracing for the adults in school was uh, uh, often a big part of the HR job and so we're looking to hire an administrative secretary to support student contact tracing the principal is the first line so if a parent uh, ha uh, had someone in their family that was uh, tested positive Positive, they would report that immediately to the principal. But knowing in our return to school, it cannot be expected that the principal can drop everything. And um, contact tracing for one positive case can often be anywhere between two and eight hours. And so we need to make sure that we have some staffing on that. We will be coming to you uh, at the end of uh, March around hiring this as a temporary position uh, for this year, this summer, and into the start of next school year so that that gets in place um, and that would be paid for with COVID funds. Um, one of the things that as I wrote the plan that was unclear uh, with uh, from state guidance uh, and I was waiting for the AB 86 uh, guidance was around testing of students. So originally I had said that we would do contact testing for students. So if they had a positive test at school or if they had a, a exposure to a student that was a student or a staff member that was positive, that we would offer the testing to students. That is not required in the AB 86, and that, that is new. Uh, um, and it's one of the challenges of this job is that the guidance is often changing, and so being able to pay attention to that. Um, the other piece, as we, um, as we know, is being able to communicate all the aspects of this plan and being able to uh, make sure that people understand when they start school, all of the expectations for them, um, that staff members are clear on all of the procedures at their their school. And so uh, in the next uh, four to six weeks, this is gonna be a big priority for us. Next slide, please. 
Uh, I talked about stable groups, I think, while we were talking about it. Um, just to uh, just be really specific is that a classroom, approximately half the class, will not mix with other classes. They will go to recess together. Um, each class will use a specific bathroom. It's like, please go down this one. And again, that's for um, student safety as well as contact tracing. And then uh, I am working with Boys and Girls Club, TTT, City of Pacifica. Uh, and we also put on our survey around uh, childcare or siblings so that we can uh, help put students in stable groups. Next slide. Um, so when we talk about uh, the to-do steps, the next to-do steps, uh, continued communication with families. I think that, uh, that what we're hearing is that people um, want to know more about the details, what are the schedules, how does this work? I'll be, we meet with the principals every Thursday and we'll be working on being able to communicate site specific plans. Um, developing the training materials for reopening. So a couple things to keep in mind is, is making sure that families have all of the information. Um, a huge part of the student uh, training happens when students get to school, but we will wanna make sure that they feel comfortable. Um, uh, for our youngest students, they only know their teacher in Zoom and they have never met them in person. Uh, one of the things we talked about in our uh, teacher meeting today was maybe perhaps as we get closer to the start is the teacher wearing a mask so that they can get used to seeing that teacher with a mask on. So those kinds of details need to be thought about. Um, and then um, again, uh, this was written on Friday, but that uh, the requirements around response testing to students is that uh, we will not be required to do that response testing for students. Um, just like I said, is that we don't have a lot of bandwidth for, um, for additional uh, things. So we all have a school job and then we have a pandemic job and then we have a return to school job. And what we have found some weaknesses in that is um, uh, what happens when the staff member at uh, doing the curative testing has to, has to quarantine. Um, how do we make sure that we have more than one person that can do contact tracing? Um, like I said, for uh, for our district, for the adults, it was HR, uh, Alexis O'Flaherty, that was doing it. And then because it became so much and we had to do it over vacation, I took on just a few days of that. And um, it is very, very time consuming. So we want to make sure. But in a return to school plan, it's the most important part is that if there is a positive case, you want to make sure that you can respond as soon as possible, identify what the situation is, and then uh, take the action and notify parents as soon as possible. Next slide. Um, so in progress is that we have moved away from the negotiating piece of, uh, of preparing with our uh, labor partners around a return to school. But I'm very, very uh, grateful to have them on the uh, planning part of the return to school as because uh, many of our teachers and our classified staff are great at logistics and they know how their schools work. So we're re really glad to have them on that team. Um, uh, uh, we have had the Google survey uh, went to, out over the weekend for the intent to return to hybrid learning. Uh, we've heard from approximately half of the family members. We will uh, resend that tomorrow. Um, and then we're working with uh, uh, principals around site implementation of plans. Uh, they're working on setting up their classrooms, setting up their schools. Uh, we um, will do uh, what I just call a friendly walkthrough, not an inspection walkthrough, uh, probably within the next week to 10 days. And uh, we've invited, um, we haven't set any dates at each of the schools, but invited both LSEA and CSEA partners, just looking for, let's go into a room and check to make sure that all of the windows um, open and make sure the desks are in the right position and that there's uh, looking for both strengths and weaknesses, um, but that's not an inspection. We will do a more formal uh, uh, way of looking uh, at the schools, but just really kind of like, okay, let's, let's kind of get a sense of the work that we need to do because schools are in different places. 
Um, I will say to you that we have arranged with a HVAC company to come out and set our, uh, each, each classroom has its own unit and uh, we will have uh, the louvers, it's a mechanical system, the louvers will be set so that 80% of the air comes in from the outside and then 20% recirculates within um, and we'll have an uh, HVAC company uh, be, visit each of the schools. It, it looks at uh, approximately two days um, and we will have that all done by the end of March. And then uh, continuing to work on those uh, redundancies in staff training. Next slide please. So uh, considerations in longer term is that what will school look like next year? And um, right now we are under the six foot rule. Um, as I said, I fully expect that that will change, um, but it would be uh, disingenuous for us to say, we're gonna open school fully next year under the guidelines that we're currently under. However, what I will say to families, and I know this is really important, um, is that we will return to as much in-person instruction as we are able to. I know that's important. We recognize it, you know, uh, it's really important to have kids back at school and uh, to do that with the, to the fullest extent that we can. So I don't wanna be disingenuous and promise something that's not currently available to us. Um, we do have to make other plans to uh, do hybrid. We will do that, but it is uh, our intention to provide school as much as we possibly can. Um, you know, I, I'm fairly certain that school will start in April. Um, I do not believe that when we think about um, when we think about a start date that April 12th is a realistic option. I think, uh, and, and I will tell you why. We had um, we are having today a, a fair number of staff members received their first vaccine. It was the Moderna vaccine, and so if we look at right now, um, it would be four weeks until the next dose and then two more weeks for immunity, uh, for the full immunity at that point. So I do believe that we will be opening in April. I just uh, do not believe that we will be opening on April 12th. I also think that we are likely to be able to, um, to uh, look at a specific date probably next week. So, um, you know, our requirements are around our agreements with our staff around the process that we use. And I just wanna make sure that I fully uh, honor that. Um, so one of the questions on the um, survey was uh, interest in full year distance learning next year. Um, I know that we will continue to have the homeschool program. Typically that was anywhere between 30 and 35 students every year. Last year there was definitely an interest and there are at least 90 students in that uh, group right now. Um, but I know this summer there were a hundred uh, that had interest in it. We were able to provide homeschooling for every person that wanted it last year. Um, so the question on full year distance learning um, is looking at the interest in that. Um, and there are some families that say, my child will not return to school until my child is vaccinated. And so that would be where we might want to look at the full year distance learning um, options that we could provide to people. It will definitely be a much smaller group. Um, and I know that we will um, offer homeschooling. Uh, probably on, at the next board meeting, we need to look at our board administrative regulations on the intra-district enrollment. Uh, this summer, we paused uh, the, uh, the movement on the wait lists in order to hold spots for students back at their homeschool uh, in both uh, newly enrolled students in the homeschool program and students in full year distance learning. We fully intend to honor that and make sure that students have a spot for them back at their uh, new year. Uh, but as I was writing the survey, one of the most challenging parts to write is, uh, is around, well, what happens next year? And we currently have students uh, that are new to our school district that we were only able to give a temporary placement to because we are holding spots for those families. And so we want families to return to their homeschool if they so choose, and then uh, be able to put the students who were in a temporary placement uh, in the schools that, that they wish to be in. And so that's a big deal in our district. And most districts don't have that because uh, most 
schools for the most part are homeschool uh, or uh, people have a neighborhood school and they attend that one. Um, and so then the other thing uh, from a board perspective is, is uh, and we will have more information uh, when this survey is completed around real interest in that full year distance learning. Uh, it shouldn't be fully distance, uh, fully year distance. Uh, um, so the challenge is when to ask and um, uh, knowing what the conditions are, are always uh, something people said, you know, we asked people to make a decision before, uh, before they had all of the information or how do you know how to do that is you just have to pick a moment in time and say, this is the amount of time. So I think we have to determine as a district, whether it's something we're going to be able to provide uh, and then determine when we might ask families. So these are all very, very, uh, you know, large projects that are going on and and um, each, you know, the return to school has probably 40 different little pieces to that. But these are the ones that I see, you know, in terms of the board looking at, um, at in the next uh, couple months. Next slide, please. Um, so if I can, um, this actually didn't end up uh, going so well in the... Uh, in this piece, but when I look at where we are, when I made this uh, last Friday, uh, in the vaccinations, we were in the in progress category. We had about 200 vac vaccinations. I don't wanna say we are substantially done because there are a couple of snafus. Uh, uh, if you haven't heard, um, some of the, uh, a fair number of our staff members received um, their first vaccination at Seton. And it turns out that there may not be enough, vac uh, enough um, vaccine for uh, staff members to receive their second vaccine there. So we're gonna work with staff members to try to go get that through their primary care physician. And because so many of our staff members are Kaiser members, those appointments should be open at that point. So I think, you know, I'd love to say substantially done. 93% is a really great start. There could be just a little blip, but we have made such progress progress on that. Um, like I said, the other huge piece of that is uh, reaching agreement uh, with uh, both CSEA and LSDA. You've now approved that, so we can count that as one. Um, the site plans we are working with principals on, and then uh, our next piece is around communicating those site plans. Um, we have uh, started the survey for families. Again, we'll do a reminder. Um, we did ask about stable groups in the Google survey and in our childcare. And then we're working on preparing the schools in the classrooms and making sure that there are uh, training on uh, uh, site specific procedures. So if I look at the piece that hasn't really been started is uh, that training on site procedures, but uh, principals are working with the staff to determine students come in here, this group uses this bathroom. So those plans are uh, firming up and being in place. There, uh, it's some schools a little bit further ahead than others, but we will be done with that. Um, it's our hope or just kind of as a target is that by uh, mid uh, March, um, which is uh, we're close to mid-March, is that the classrooms will be uh, set up and that we're looking at signage and um, markings of hallways. Um, and then we are looking at a end of March to do a, a more formal or a close, uh, closer look at that. And then following those um, those uh, walkthroughs with our LSEA, CSEA partners, principals, uh, district office staff, uh, when those are all done, then we will invite uh, trustees to come in and see the school set up uh, for that. Next steps. Um, so future meetings, uh, that we have some future meetings uh, focused on site preparations and developing materials. Uh, our association presidents don't know this, but the uh, schools in um, that have already been in um, uh, in-person learning and have been for some time in the southern part of uh, of San Mateo County uh, are inviting us to a uh, Zoom meeting where we can learn from their lessons. And so uh, that will either be March 22nd or March 23rd. Um, and we can uh, work with our uh, return to school task force around that. Um, all of our teachers and all of our staff members will be invited to that. It, it doesn't just have to be task force members. So next slide. 
Um, so where can one uh, learn about the return to school is as we is that, you know, my commitment to the very best that I can is a once a week update. Uh, as you know, uh, this week that the update um, didn't happen until the weekend time. And uh, but I'm going to do my very best to get something out to staff and families uh, every week. Um, staff, we've been uh, actually typically there's this uh, last week and, and uh, the previous week have been vaccine update. Uh, you know, here's where you can get your vaccine. Here's where you can get this information. So for the staff, it's been a little bit more than once a week uh, because we've been very, very focused on, on, um, on the vaccinations. Uh, we are trying to take the message that I wrote and put that under the superintendent's message also taking any board presentations and putting those just to the left of the superintendent's message so that information is on there. Um, the district plan is on the district website. Um, we're working on frequent, frequently asked questions. I had a couple people ask me some questions uh, this week and I said, hey, can I use that for the frequently asked questions? We have some of those also from um, the return to school task force and we will get those up as absolutely soon as possible. Um, so that uh, people will have as much information as possible. And then uh, keeping updated in school newsletters is so that we'll have district communication and then uh, you, you'll be seeing a little bit each week from your school principals. Next slide. Um, so I think uh, before we go to board discussion, do we want to do um, comment? I think we're gonna go through the public comment. Um, I can go through, we'll call people up um, as they had put their names in the Q&A. Just a reminder that we cannot answer questions that have been put in the Q&A or comments, um, but if you'd like to speak on the item, just put your name in and the item that you wanna speak on. You'll have three minutes when we bring you forward, the timer will show, and then you will be muted after the three minutes because we have so many people today. So I think the first one, up would be Christina Bailey. Great, can you guys hear me? Yes. <laughs> Wonderful, all right. I come to you tonight, not as a teacher in the district, but as a parent of three children, third, fifth, and seventh grade in our Pacifica School District. Over and over again, I've heard how the younger children need to return to school. In that, I also hear that the older children don't need a return as much as the younger children do. This is painfully not true. I teach TK to students, TK to two students for the district and have grades three to seven represented in my own home, all in our Pacifica school district. My youngest is doing the best of all of my children. My middle child is suffering with social, emotional and self-esteem issues. And my oldest is suffering the most serious mental health implications. Middle school has very clear markers in developmental milestones. According to the CDC, they show more independence from parents and family they start to think about the future. They understand more about his or her place in the world. They pay more attention to friendships and teamwork. They wanna be liked and accepted by friends. According to psychologists, as they enter the middle school years, tweens begin to have two new needs. One is a need for increased independence. The other is an increasing need for meaningful interactions with adults who are not their parents. In other words, tweens crave freedom yet also want adult support. It is a terrible devastation. This is not hyperbole. This has been something shared in many very distraught conversations for my oldest to think that her siblings in our own home and ultimately the entire district, including K-8 schools will return to more, if not an absolution in comparison to herself and her peers at the comprehensive middle school. It is truly out of touch to say that primary students are more in need of a return to the middle school than middle school students. All students need to return and all for different reasons. Middle school students' social and emotional health is connected to their academic confidence and socialization is built into their day. They don't wanna to go to school to talk about their feelings. They wanna to go to school to see their friends and learn. And along the way, all the other developmental milestones are sorting themselves out through the built-in inherent opportunities that are thereby afforded to them within that experience. Within the current plan, students under this format format with a staggered start schedule will have only four math live learning days before the end of the school year, let alone all of their other subjects. How will this prepare them for next year or high school? Please show these young people that they matter as much as all the other students in Pacifica School District. Where is the equity and equality for these children? Bring them back two days a week, just like 
what is being offered to every other student in our district. Finally, I wanna thank all of our teachers in Pacifica School District. Thank you for wanting more and for advo advocating for more for our students and children. And I have to say personally, I've spoken quite a bit and this is the first time I've become so emotional. So thank you for your time. Thanks, Christina. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have Jesse Lang next. Uh, thank you. Um, so my biggest concern is, uh, as the uh, superintendent mentioned, um, that you know that going back two days a week is is going to be more convenient for parents. Um, I think that's that's the last concern right now uh, for us. I think it's more about quality of education. And if you look at the proposed schedule with uh, having two days uh, with the two the A and B groups. Uh, let's say that your your child is uh, in the A group. They go to school Monday, Tuesday. Uh, you cram in five days worth of stuff into those two days, uh, so their retention is going to be way down. Uh, with that, uh, the thirty minute um, Zoom sessions. By the time the teachers take roll, get all their stuff together, um, you're you're talking about less than twenty minutes. So there's going to be no instruction on those other three days. So now they're pretty much going five days without any sort of instruction. It's even worse if your kid is in the Thursday, Friday group, because now you're gonna have your assigned work on Monday uh, for all the stuff you're supposed to learn, but you don't actually get any sort of instruction until Thursday. So th this plan just is not gonna work um, as far as quality of education. And that's what I mean, That's I, I was born and raised in the city. Uh, I grew up going to all these schools. That was the big thing, the big draw here is is the quality of schools here. Um, with that, I mean, I, I know that there's other schools, not only in the county, but even in our own city that are open full time. I understand that that's a private school, uh, but they're supposed to be adhering to the same county guidelines. So I, I don't know if it's just parents have more power because they go to private school. Um, and so you talk about the equality, I, I 99% sure that Dr. Morrow uh, can grant exceptions. And if not, I know that other schools have just pushed through that. Um, in addition to the uh, Monday, Tuesday cohort, uh, you also have a Memorial Day. So that means that the kids are now gonna be down to one day for that week of any sort of education. Um, and then I have a couple of questions that I understand can't be answered, but you know, ensuring that families are on the same schedule. So uh, I don't want to take up too much time, but the biggest thing for me is it, if we can't go back full time, full days now, um, we definitely need to be there next year, regardless of what is going on. Uh, kids do not contract or do not have a substantial effects from this. You look at all the data, uh, there's already been numerous studies uh, into this and none of them are showing any sort of ill effects on kids, so. Okay, thank you. Um, Jesse Lang, you next we'll have Kate. Uh, I can't pronounce that. Um, Will Hagar, I'm massacring your last name, sorry. Hello? There you go, we got you. Hi, sorry. Um, so yeah, um, I'm a parent with two children at Cabrillo, a fourth grader and a sixth grader. And basically my nieces and nephews attend school in the Dry Creek School District, which is in Placer County, less than two hours away. This district started developing a comprehensive plan to safely open schools last March when this all began. They used a full remote distance learning model only until school ended in June. When the new school year began, they methodically moved through a hybrid and then a modified day with all students. Students who wish to remain learning in a virtual environment also had the ability to do so. They have maintained extremely low case rates in schools with the vast majority of cases traced directly back to family or social gatherings outside of school. Now that their staff has had the chance to be vaccinated if they choose, they are planning to reopen to a full-time, five-day-a-week schedule, April 12th. Our own district's mission statement states that we prepare each child 
to meet the challenges of the future by providing an equitable, rigorous academic program, which nurtures curiosity and inspires joy, confidence, and achievement in learning. Our proposed learning model is definitely not rigorous. I highly doubt it nurtures any type of curiosity, and it definitely does not inspire joy or confidence in our children at this time. It is our students' best interest socially, emotionally, and academically to be in school. This needs to be the guiding principle and schools need to reopen fully in the fall as it has already proven to be safe. We have the right to know what is taking so long. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up we have Aaron Pickett. Hi, um, you know, uh, Kate, I, I just have to ditto exactly what she just said. Um, we were literally told this evening by Heather's presentation that they don't feel the need to take advantage of the funding that's offered to us to return to school by April 1st, which is mind boggling. Um, six feet is not in order. It's a guideline. Schools have been instructed to do the best they can. And we absolutely can return safely to school with all of these safety precautions. I don't understand what is the roadblock. What are we not being told? Who is making these decisions to not give us a date to return to school? Vaccinations are plenty. Let's get this going. And as the last three people just said, Christina, Jesse, Kate, to actually think that we wouldn't be returning full time in the fall is so completely neg negligent to our children and the families. So please, can you tell us what is at work? What are we not seeing as a community? Because everyone speaking out here tonight is saying one thing and the board and the district is saying another. So if someone could give us some clear information and some clear answers on what's happening, it would be much appreciated. Thank you. Okay, next we have Namita McLean. Hi, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I'm so intimidated because these speakers have just been so awesome. And I kind of want to just say ditto, 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 but I'm going to be a big girl and give my own uh, little talk here. So my name is Namita and I have a sixth grade son at IBL. I want to start with my shout outs. First is to Megan Ellsburn. Um, who I think really got everyone vaccinated at Cabrillo. I know she was on the phone with me for like an hour refreshing, and I'm just a substitute. I'm not even a full-time teacher, so shout out to her. I want to give a shout out to the IBL teachers, my son's teachers, Ms. Holden, Ms. Toomey, Mr. Bolter, who have single-handedly saved my kid's life. I really believe that. And I said I wasn't going to get emotional, and here I go. Here. So my first concern is transparency from the districts in trying to get information about this board meeting, dates, times, Zoom links. It was nearly impossible. I had to receive my information from Facebook. I'm not sure if this is a reason why this, there, why, if there is a reason why this info is not being communicated and emails are on the main page of the website more clearly. I think you would find more engaged parents and maybe that's not what you want, but I think you would find more angered parents if there was more clear communication because I think we would be definitely more all over it. My second question is specifically to IBL. My son is in sixth grade. They're already in cohorts. Uh, the plan, Dr. Olson, that you talked about does refer to a lot of the issues that maybe the seventh and eighth graders would have, but I'm not sure that applies to the sixth graders. Uh, they have two teachers for their four core classes. They go in between. I think there's limited contact. I'm not sure uh, where the problem is for the sixth graders. Uh, number two is more of a question. Do our sixth graders at IBL have to wait till the sixth graders return from the K-8s or can they start when the kindergartners start um, with the K-8s or are we having to wait? If IBL is just sitting open, our students aren't returning, um, I think it's a missed opportunity to at least get the process started and to get the bar uh, ball rolling. IBL is really unique with its infrastructure, seeing it's all outdoors, no indoor hallways, two exterior doors for each class and windows that open with lots of ventilation. And so I would think the goal would be to get as many kids on that campus as soon as possible. And my concern as a teacher, as an educator, I'm currently teaching fifth grade is apathy. These kids are burnt out and tired and have serious distance learning fatigue. They are in desperate need of our help. 
We need to get these kids re-engaged, and I think getting them on campus is essential to making this happen. The current plan to have kids in person twice a week, meaning they would see each of their teachers only once a week is unacceptable. With two days on and three days off, I'm not sure how these kids are gonna learn anything. And I guess what I'm concerned about is how do our kids compete? I have a daughter who's in high school. She's been back to school since November um, and they're making it work. We've had only two incident incidents of students um, contracting the virus, not from um, the school. Um, I don't understand how other kids or other schools are doing this and they're able to do this. Okay, next up we have um, Amber Friedler. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, so as you picked up, my name is Amber Friedler. I'm a parent of four children whom attend Valley Marsh School. They are ages 13, a seventh grader, whom I agree with Christina Bailey is suffering the most. I have a 10 year old who is a fifth grader who is also suffering greatly. A seven year old whom is a first grader who is struggling severely with reading and writing as months of his school career had been devastatingly cut short due to COVID. And a five year old who will be thrown into this situation in Valley Marsh come fall. The mental health of our children is deteriorating as this pandemic has gone on an entire year. Students in several states and districts all over the county, including our own, have fallen victim to depression and anxiety due to not being in school, which has led most districts, except for our own, to open. School offers so much more than an education, which should be enough in itself to make your decision for return to in-person learning an easy one, you would think. For children, it is an emotional outlet away from home. It's a social education amongst other things. These children, my own included, are all in your hands. Your decisions will affect them directly. If science has proven and agrees, that states very clearly that the spread amongst children is not of great concern. And on top of that, the staff will be fully vaccinated upon return in the spring, let alone the fall. What is the reason for not opening full time in the fall? Our kids are already in a fragile mental state and have lost so much as it is. Other districts are in session, and now as a district, you are knowingly and intentionally against the facts, taking away the rights of our children in our community. The well-being of our children and families depend on your decisions. Are you willing to be held accountable for the physical, social, and emotional damage your decisions will further cause? How much more do you expect our children to take? And yes, I am addressing the board, the LSEA, and Dr. Heather Olson. What is it going to take? Our children, are you waiting for a situation like Nevada had with suicide rates among children rapidly increasing? Health and safety goes beyond physical, it's emotional as well, and that needs to be taken into immense consideration. Let's refer to your chart, Dr. Olson. Enrollment wouldn't be going down if our district was back in school. Parents are moving to private schools because we want our kids in so desperately. Does that say nothing? Your charts alone prove it. That's how crucial being in school is. Parents are willing to pay every last dime they have for their kids' mental health and education, part of which entails back in school, in a private school, in the same town, no less, that has been open for months. They have done so safely and effectively. Have you guys used them as models of how to function? Have you had any correspondence as to why or how they can make it work. And what about the people that can't afford to pay private schools? Our kids just have to suffer in your hands? I am dumbfounded how other districts in our county. Okay, next we have Naomi Gutierrez. Hi there, can you hear me? We can. Okay, <laughs> that unmute was a little tricky. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I am a mother of a seventh grader at IBL and I have a second grader at Cabrillo. Um, so much of what has been shared tonight is so profoundly accurate and really represents the sentiments of the vast majority of parents that I have had the opportunity to talk to in this community. Um, to say that 
we are struggling as a community, as a direct result of the decision to continue the situation with homeschooling and distance learning uh, is an understatement. Um, we have children that are losing education, they are losing self-confidence, they are losing friends, they are losing contact, they are losing themselves. My own children are very outgoing by nature and both have become much more withdrawn as every month has gone by. I don't understand why we are so afraid to challenge the status quo. I don't understand why there are other districts and other schools just over the hill that have figured out how to do it. I don't understand what the problem is. I don't feel like we're being told the truth and it is very concerning. This town is losing families every day. We have had to say goodbye to many families that have left this town forever because of the challenges with the schooling. We don't want Pacifica to be known as a place that has failed its children. Let us not fail our children. Heather Olson, please do not fail our children. Board, trustees, do not fail our children. They don't have anybody else and we all need to come together to make some really hard decisions and stand up for what's right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, uh, were we having Sharika Abi now? I have a Shelly Ramirez. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Hi. So I am a mother of um, three kids. I have to deal with uh, three different schools, Sunset Ridge, fifth grade, seventh grade IBL. And I also have a junior at um, Oceana. So that's two different school districts. To say that my life has changed for the worst is an understatement. I never thought that distance learning will have me on suicide watch. I do not want my kids sleeping next to me on the floor because I'm afraid what they will do at night. Um, I'm blessed with a job that I can tell my boss I can't go to the office because I cannot leave my children unsupervised because what I'm afraid they will do. I see that you mentioned that the school will not open until all the teachers receive their first and second doses and two weeks of the full immunity. Um, there's a lot of businesses out there that have continued to work with the protocol, the disinfection, the PPE, and they have made it work. I have not seen any nurses stop providing services because they didn't have a vaccination. So the teachers need to step up, and this is on their MOU from what, I, what I've heard before. They need to care for our kids. I know they're scared. I know COVID is scary, but losing a life because you're afraid of going back to work, it's not something that I will be able to forget. My children have suffered tremendously. My youngest one has done the best out of all three, but I am so afraid for my middle one. I have never seen her like this. And also, you guys are opening map the schools for four hours. Are you serious? Two days a week for four hours. That is not acceptable. We have all the research. We have all the guidance throughout the country to open up schools with all the safety protocols. So what is stopping the school district from doing the right thing? I'm terrified of what I'm not able to do. It's beyond my control. Psychiatry and counselors are on speed dial and it, that's the new normal and I'm supposed to accept that? That is ridiculous. I am so sorry. I'm emotional, but I'm upset because I feel like my children deserve better. And I don't wanna blame somebody for something that will happen if you guys do not address the emotional needs of kids. They need to be put first. They need to be a priority over all the teachers that are afraid to go back to work. Okay, do, do I think we skipped over a couple of people? 
Are we going to be, go back to find them next? Um, we're bringing the Sarika B and Mike Harold. Okay. Well, okay, we'll go on to Michelle Dion, but we, we did skip to back there. Hello, um, thank you to the board, Dr. Olson, for continuing to make the tough decisions to keep safety the priority and returning to in-person learning. I was not planning on speaking tonight, um, but I was highly offended by the implication that teachers are holding out to return to school in an effort to get a pay raise. How demoralizing for our teachers. Anyone who has followed or paid attention to LSEA's concerns would know that the concerns of being the lowest paid district in San Mateo County has been an ongoing issue for as long as my kids have been attending Pacifica School District. And I have an eighth grader. So we're at the end of the road with Pacifica School District for him. Um, and this has been an ongoing issue. I want to stress to any teacher listening tonight to know that they are supported, appreciated. I understand the countless hours that they have put in through the challenges of distant learning, many of them going above and beyond the hours that they are actually paid for. And I want to personally thank them. Um, I came on tonight to listen to the tribute to Patty McNally. My fifth grader was in Patty McNally's class this year and had to suffer the loss of his teacher. And that was only within two months of finding out that his second grade teacher had passed away, Mr. Noonan. So yeah, things have been pretty devastating for my family too, and I get it, but I still think that the safety and the importance of following the guidelines and San Mateo County's health ordinances needs to be the priority. I stand by the statements I made in my February 7th email to the board members. And I just cannot wrap my head around the concept that parents do not want to trust the judgments of teachers in regards to safe return, but are jumping at the opportunity to hand their precious child into those same teachers' care. Either we trust the judgment of our teachers or we don't. I, for one, trust them completely. And I'm putting my children, who are my most precious things, into their care and I wholeheartedly trust them to keep them safe. And in fact, today, as I said, I wasn't planning on talking, but just today I emailed each and every one of my teachers, my kids' teachers, and acknowledged how important they have been through this distant learning challenges. I have an eighth grader who's actually thriving in distant learning. I have a fifth grader who would love to go back. He'll take the two days. He'll take the four hours for two days a week and be thrilled at the opportunity to interact with his students. Again, I wanna thank all of you for making that very tough decision. Um, clear that uh, there's a lot of angst and anger and political around this. Thank you. Will, can we go back up to the top to make sure we get Michelle? Or maybe it's Christy that's doing that. We skipped over just a few people. Yeah, one of them just screened it. What about Mike Harold? And there was Jessica too. I think there was a Jessica, right? I thought, thought I saw Jessica too. Jessica Lang. Oh, no, Jessica, Jessica, Jessica Lang Jessica. spoke earlier. Oh, he already spoke. Um, yeah, Rebecca, I know, was on um, two items. Did, Rebecca Platzer. Do we have Rebecca there? I don't think she's on the call anymore. Yeah. I know we're, uh, yeah. I don't see Michelle, I don't see Mike. Um, some of the others are comments in there. Um, Okay, thank you. Rachel Merlot. She, uh, oh, she, she withdrew a request, okay. Yeah, uh, oh, and then she put that she would like to speak. <laughs> There's three there. Hi. Hi, Rachel. Hi, there sorry, I, I was not actually planning on speaking, but um, I just feel like I um, just wanted to comment both as a teacher um, in our district, as 
just in my own personal sense at IBL as well as a parent of a second grader. And I just wanted to publicly discuss how vastly different my experiences have been working with the middle school and what I'm seeing happening um, with our older students and a lot of the same sentiments that parents are having with a grave concern um, versus my second graders experience. And, you know, overall it's going fairly well. Um, I'd also like to say that I've been heavily involved in coming up with any possible way to get students back on campus um, safely in any way possible. Um, I was speaking with the superintendent today. I have been involved in every possible meeting possible. I'm looking at my middle schoolers and their own mental health, my own mental health doing this. It's really challenging to know that the best of what we can do is not good enough. And I'm just urging the district to please, we need to have some concrete ways that we need to remember also that as much as it is our, our emotional health, that goes directly involved with students' education and our duty as educators. I understand parents' frustrations. We, most of us are parents that are teachers. And I just really, really hope that there is a lot of focus on our middle schoolers as just as much as the, as the younger grades. I'm sorry if this was a little choppy. I wasn't really prepared, but thank you. Okay. Julie Cotter. I don't see Julie Carter on the on the. No, she, she's yeah, already she's on the screen. Just need to unmute. Just to unmute. Just to unmute. Julie, you uh, you're on mute. Okay, sorry about that. There you go. Um, <laughs> I'm not used to having headphones, and so it's kind of echoey. Um, I just want to say thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak. My kids are in third and fifth grade at Ortega. One is thriving in distance learning, the other is floundering. Um, it's not due to the teachers by any means. Teachers are working harder than they've ever had, but the problem is, is the lessons aren't reaching all of our kids. We have dynamic learners and dynamic teachers reduced to a two-dimensional learning process, dependent on whether or not there are distractions at home, whether or not there is parent supervision, whether or not your child learns well on Zoom, and one of mine does not. I really appreciate that the teachers um, want to be vaccinated, and I think we need to support that. And I appreciate that the district is doing everything that they can to make that happen. Um, I think that we cannot take the virus lightly, but unfortunately, by isolating our students, we have incurred other casualties. Um, I'm not a medical expert, so I want to defer to the experts. This is from a letter dated, um, sorry, January 13th, 2021 in which a group of Bay Area doctors signed a letter calling for California schools to reopen February 1st. Um, among these doctors who advocated for students is Dr. Jean Noble, Director of COVID Response at the UCSF Emergency Department, and it was signed by 30 additional medical professionals. I just want to put this in here because I think it's so important, um, you know, to, to document some of the things that are happening. The Emergency Department at Benoist Children's Hospital in Oakland reported a temporal increase in the proportion of all children and youth ages 10 to 17 who reported suicidal ideation from 6% in March 2020 to 16% in September 2020. So unfortunately, we have this really tricky situation where we've got to balance the mental health of our students, you know, versus the physical safety. And at this point, at least in my house, the mental health is really taking a toll. Um, I want to also talk about the permanent effects of, of kind of COVID on young kids. Um, and I quote again from the article, school closures have widened the achievement gap. Educational inequities have the potential to translate into a lifelong barrier and staggering number of life years lost. In California, many private schools reopened during the fall, while the majority of public schools have been closed since March. The essential societal role of public education is reflected in Article 9 of California's Constitution, which mandates unfettered access to education for all children to ensure that a child's ability to participate in public education is not dependent on the financial means of their family. And my worry is that you're driving 
a lot of families out that are going to private education and we're gonna lose even more funding for our schools. I don't, I don't know about the plan to go back. I, I realize all of the concerns, but I really hope that you consider going back full time. Next we have Monica. Um, I agree <clears throat> with Amber <laughs> and a lot of parents. Um, I would also like to ask, um, are you hiring and spending money on these surveys that really aren't telling us anything? Um, why are you sending us messages to tell us you're sending a message? Um, have you figured out a plan for recess? What have you physically done to actually prepare for school in person? Are these surveys, are they actually doing anything or are you just doing this to keep the peace? That's it, thank you. I think that's the last one that requested to speak. Um, comments in the in the Q and A we cannot respond to. I think that covers everybody. Okay, we never could find Mike Harold. Okay, we can go ahead with a board discussion on this. Um, I'll start with the. Let's see. Who's up next? Trusty Burkini. Um, well, <clears throat> thank you everybody that's put a lot of work into this. I think the most exciting thing out of all of it was to hear that 93% of the staff and uh, teachers are vaccinated. That's amazing and exciting. And I'm glad to hear a lot of my friends are uh, getting better, uh, getting that um, I um, <laughs> yeah I think this plan has been thought of thought through very well uh, we've been working on this since last summer it's been there's many many places where it stopped us over and over again um, but the, I guess there's a misconception that nobody's been doing anything and that's not the case in fact some people haven't taken a vacation since March last year um, so, um, thank you for all of you that are putting the work into this. I'm looking forward to getting those kids back on campus. Um, and it's not ideal. I've got kids in school too. I'd love them to be there the full time for five days, but that's just not the situation we're in right now. Um, but I do think looking ahead, there's great things coming and, um, we can get through this little phase. It's going to get better. And, um, so hang in there, <laughs> but uh, thank you. I'm, I think it looks good. Trustee Steele, do you have any comments? Yeah, um, a, a lot to unpack there with everything. So thank you to everyone that, um, that spoke. It's, uh, it, it is not an easy situation. I mean, for anybody involved, whether your children are thriving, whether they are suffering, whether you yourself are thriving, whether you yourself are suffering, um, but I, you know, I, I don't think there's an <laughs> an easy solution to um, to any of it. Um, yeah, um, you just sort of at a loss for words there. I think the only thing I remember from teaching was um, my my teacher guide in the classroom. She said, "Never give a moving target," um, and that's in this entire situation, it's been a moving target that you know, it's just it, it feels impossible to nail down. You know, uh, you're ready to go back, and then all of a sudden things spike. Um, you're you're doing the best that you can, and you know you're just thankful for everybody involved in the process, parents, students, um, all the way to the higher ups um, in California that are just uh, truly trying their best since March 13th of 2020 to uh, to get us all back to where we all want to be. Um, I don't think there's a person in California, in the nation, in the world that says, you know, I don't want to be back in the classroom. Um, I think every single person um, can agree on the fact that we all want to be back. Um, so we're excited for that moment when it does happen. Okay, thank you. Um, Trustee Villalobos. Uh, okay, I think I've made a lot of notes, but I'm going to um, my battles. Uh, the the couple of things that really stood out to me is that 
I'm feeling like our teachers aren't being appreciated. And I know that we, we want to focus on our children. That is why everybody is here. And so I just want everybody to realize that we care about the kids, we care about the teachers, we care about the staff. And, you know, we were just thrown into COVID and we've done our best, you know, by getting the task force together, getting representatives from every different group of people, including the parents. Um, you know, I just feel like we just need to take a step back and a deep breath and then, um, you know, start reengaging again because there are some things that are very positive, like the 93% of our staff and teachers that are vaccinated. Um, um, Trustee Villalobos, yeah. sorry to interrupt. We need to take a vote to extend the meeting in the next four minutes. So <laughs> um, can we take a vote to um, but extend the meeting till 11 or 11.30? How, how would we do that, Dr. Olson? You're muted. The board policy says uh, that we can ex uh, at 1030 agree to extend it for a half an hour. Uh, I will be frank, there are some business items on this agenda that have to happen uh, before March 15th. Um, so that's just, we can ex uh, extend until 11 or we could as a body recognize that this is a really important topic and we don't want to shortchange the discussion. So perhaps could we think about extending till 1130? Um, I'm okay with 1130 because I know there are things we do need to get done. Others? Uh, we need I'm fine with that. Okay. All right. Um, Kelly, can you take a vote to or all motion to extend the meeting to 1130? Hopefully it'll be sooner. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Bradal. Yes. Trustee Burkini. Yes. Trustee Steele. Yes. Trustee Villalobos. Yes. Thank you. The motion passes 4-0. Okay. Sorry, Laverne. You're oh, on. That's okay. So, um, I do want to, um, address that I see that it's very important that our kids get back to school right away. And so I just want to ask, because there's still some questions lingering out there. Um, one of the things I heard is that the, te the um, parents have a right to know what is taking so long. Why can't we open to full days in August? So I'm just wondering if we can take that and answer those questions. If, if you could answer those questions, Dr. Olson. Sure, I'll, I'll answer the first one, which is why is it taking us so long to open is, uh, I think I said in the presentation, is that we took a conservative tack around uh, our staff being vaccinated and having access to both of that, those vaccines and two weeks later. So that was a decision we knew when we made it that it um, that it would take longer. I'm frankly actually surprised that we're as far along as we are. And that has to do with staff going out to get the um, uh, vaccine during their vacation, their relentlessness around this and their communication with, with me around uh, that. So, so I, we are actually um, closer to on schedule than I thought we would be, but that was a bold move to make that decision. I know that it was a hard one to make, um, but, uh, and it is different than many other school districts chose. Um, and so, so that would be, why is it taking so long? That's exactly it. I think in terms of, it was also a little bit more unpredictable in terms of setting the date, but I, I feel like next week we will be able to set that date for the reopening. And as we said, I think that uh, it, the opening will happen in April. And um, I expect that, uh, you know, even mid-April, just not that week of April 12th. Uh, so that's becoming clearer and clearer. Uh, remind me of your second question again. Yeah, it's getting later into the night, my ability to do multiple That's questions. why I just picked just a couple. Um, the 
the other one too is I just want to express that I know I've heard a lot of comments this evening about the proof and the science and the studies. Um, if anybody has a moment, they can go on the CDC website and look for the Georgia um, schools um, study that they did uh, from December 1st to January 22nd. And what it showed is that the children, you know, we, we know that for some reason they just don't uh, get COVID like we do. And that most of the transmission in that study was from teacher to teacher. And so I feel like we definitely made the best choice, you know, in um, working around getting everybody vaccinated. And I just remember Dr. Olson, can you remind me of how many um, teachers and staff have tested positive without any students there, but um, at school still working? Um, students, uh, students, none, because uh, they haven't been on campus. Uh, I don't know that I would be able to uh, say off of the top of my head, there was a period of time, um, November through January, that uh, at least half of Alexis's time was on, on contact tracing. I would say ballpark, maybe 15, um, no transmission within school, um, but we have had um, staff members have to uh, quarantine as a result of a close contact, either from their family or a few of them that happened at school. So I'll just ballpark that and say between 13 and 15, um, and none of that transmission happened at school. Thank you. Um, the other question I have is why can't we open fully back to full days come August? Um, the answer to that is that we are currently, we currently um, are under the guidance of San Mateo County. And right now their guidance for, um, for distance is six feet. They hold on to that. Other counties have done less than that, but in San Mateo County, they're still holding on to that six feet. I do think that's gonna be an important part of our return to school. Um, I think kids, we're gonna teach kids like as they're, uh, as they're inside the classroom, as they're outside the classroom, is that six feet matters a lot. They, they know that. Um, uh, depends on the age of the students, but six feet does matter a lot. Um, at this point, we are, it's not optional. Uh, determining whether to follow the public health orders of the San Mateo County is not optional. We are responsible for the safety of uh, both students and staff, and uh, we we don't disregard what those what those orders are and want to do the very best. As I said, I do believe that that, that distance will likely get less. Be great if they would do that right now, but I know that that may or may not be likely. So it's our intention to have kids in school as much as possible. And we will do that as the orders allow. And so if it becomes a space issue, could we lower our class size slightly like we did with um, this previous year to per permit uh, distance learning? Like, are we able to lower that class size so that there might not be 32 kids sitting in a fifth grade classroom so that we can have a little bit more freedom? We will do our very best on that. Maybe we can use some of these COVID funds to, to do that, but it really is right now the six feet that, are, that is keeping that and, you know, it is not optional. Um, that was that was part of the other Georgia study is that um, the mitigations were not happening in some of the schools because of too many kids in a classroom. So I do think that's um, one of the most important things. But um, what do we need to do like within the next week to get a date to return in April? Uh, the most important thing to do that, I think, would be uh, me scheduling a, a, a meeting with uh, Megan Ellsberg. Uh, I, I, we spoke at the beginning of the week in preparation for this meeting, uh, and I told her that I would be likely scheduling a meeting with her and looking at how many more people need the vaccine, what would be you know, the start date of that. I also, uh, while it's not a requirement of the agreement with CSEA, we'll be meeting with Nicole Sayers on that. We have approximately 25 staff members that still need the vaccine. Uh, tomorrow morning, uh, um, 
our HR team. Uh, so today, the principals reached out to everyone who had not yet been vaccinated, and we got a whole ton more of people. Uh, I, I know that during this meeting, other people have reported uh, that they've received their first vaccine. So we are making progress day by day. I'm going to ask my uh, HR team to help with phone calls around uh, getting. Um, so I think we're very, very, very close, and it's most likely that next week we will be able to say, here's our starting date. All right, so we can look forward to that next week or we can. Follow up yep. and maybe do an email to the community or the parents so that they're aware of what is going on. The other thing is um, the eighth grader who spoke tonight uh, really touched me. So can we have a graduation? So my my earlier answer to this, she touched me too as well, and it's it's very hard not to instantly respond on that, is right now, based on those orders, we can't have an event that has 200 people in it. However, just like um, many things that I expect uh, to change is we're anticipating some guidance around uh, promotion and graduation ceremonies. Uh, and so, um, Maybe they're waiting for it to get into orange so that it could be a little bit more permissive. I don't even know. I'm speculating on that. I have no evidence to think that, but it does help us as we move into orange. Uh, things will begin to open up. And so my commitment to uh, the principals and to the eighth graders and the parents is that we will provide the very most that we can at based on what the guidance is on that. And I think there are opportunities. It certainly will hold them outside. Um, that seems to be the very safest. But uh, even for one of the K-8 schools with 60 students, right now we can't have a gathering of 200. Um, churches and movie theaters can have 100 people in them. Schools are not to have gatherings of 100. And so Again, what I would say to folks is just recognize that things will change. And if we keep communicating about the parts and the boundaries uh, around what we have to do and where there's room in that, I think we can make something. There's a lot of time between March and June and lots that will change. And so just recognize um, it's, it was never a district decision to cancel uh, uh, promotion ceremonies. Uh, I, I just want to communicate with people. We have to follow the guidance that we're in at that time right now. And we can't say, oh, it'll be better by June. Let's let's plan a big shindig. Um, so as long as they're willing to work with the principals, and uh, I think, you know, we have four schools that will have uh, uh, graduating eighth graders. How can we work together to secure, you know, safe outdoor, uh, um, situation so that families and students can celebrate together. So again, we're not going to break any health orders. We're not going to break any laws or any guidance, but I, I do believe it can happen. Thank you for putting that into perspective, especially, you know, about the movie theaters and the capacity levels and the guidance that we're still under with um, the county. Um, I think that was it for now that I had, but I, I just really, um, I really empathize with the parents, you know, and um, the effects that it's having on the kids. I have a college student and I can see the effects there. And, you know, so I think we understand, you know, my aunt is a teacher, got COVID, a bad case of COVID. She got it from school. So I think everybody, you know, like I said, we're, we all have our different experiences and whatnot, but, you know, the teachers are doing great. I wish, you know, that um, our kids were doing better. Um, you know, I understand that the older ones, you know, the sixth, seventh, and eighth graders, you know, they, they know what they're missing. The kindergartners, the first graders may not know yet. So I'm just wondering what resources do we have for those kids right now? Can they get help? somehow right now if they need to talk to somebody. Um, I, I'll answer that. So uh, our um, schools have, our schools that have sixth through eighth graders do have counselors at them. IBL has a full-time counselor. Uh, Valimar and Cabrillo share a counselor. 
and Ocean Shore has YSB as counselors, and they also have one of our um, pieces around adding uh, the one-year uh, vice principal is uh, support for kids as well. So that's that's one piece. The other thing that we have um, in place is um, it's a, just a, um, a connecting uh, students with uh, mental health services. It's called Care Solace. Uh, it came to us from Molly Henricks of San Mateo County Office of Education. We introduced it right, I think, before the February break, and we've had a number of families uh, use it for both adults and children. So any staff member or their family, any students, student, uh, or students' family member uh, can use it to seek guidance. And basically what they try to do is connect you with a counselor that's covered by your insurance. And if you don't have insurance, uh, it is uh, provides you know low cost options on that. So that, that is one thing if a counselor isn't available to you. Um, another thing that I'm super excited about is that one of our district's secret weapons, um, her name is Christina Ierson, is coming back to work after being on uh, parental leave. Uh, she's coming back to work in April just as we come back to uh, school. And um, she is an expert in terms of student mental health. And one of the things we will want to work with her on is how do we help, uh, you know, kids that are in such crisis, like um, recognizing that right now they're in crisis, uh, uh, that we have our school counselors. But as we return to school, um, being able to benefit from uh, Miss Ierson's coming back. And then thirdly is just continuing to remember that we're the beneficiaries of a social emotional learning curriculum that um, uh, called Caring School Communities that we've had some training in January around implementing. But I know that one of the challenges is how do you do that in a distant environment is one of the things that I uh, highly encouraging as we come back is how do we um, as we reintroduce ourselves to, to new friends and old friends is how do we use that social emotional learning curriculum? This is such an incredibly hard time. I don't know an adult or a child that is not emotionally dysregulated. Like everyone is upset and it's so hard and, um, and we all get that. But if I can give anybody any hope is there is light at the end of this tunnel. Like by July, all adults that want the vaccine will have access to the vaccine. That will be huge. If um, there may be a vaccine available to um, for students, you know, October, November, again, that's huge. It seems so daunting and it seems like this first step is either a big one or some people think the step is not big enough, but it's a step and it's a step forward. Like I said, two big things happened for us this week was uh, settling uh, negotiations and uh, having so much success with the vaccine. You know, a big step is going to be returning students to school. And you know, we I hear uh, folks about the eight, about the middle school kids and their need, and you know they don't need it less. I think I think um, from the AB 86, the piece was that the youngest kids need it the most. But what I hear from our group is that that really is one of the biggest areas of needs. And so we may be able to look at a rollout that will maximize kid time at school. Um, not opposed to that. Um, so. We'll work on that. And then I just have one last comment. Um, you know, we're making all these steps to open in mid-April, and we have spring break coming up. Mm -hmm. And I would just like to ask the families, you know, if they're going away, you know, when they come back, you know, to maybe be extra cautious, you know, before we start returning to school. You actually bring up a great point because again, in our current guidance, right now where we are, if someone is to leave the Bay Area, um, go 120 miles outside of the Bay Area, they need to quarantine uh, for uh, 10 days. And so that does present a challenge in terms of returning to safely. I, I actually talked to the teachers about this uh, and um, People are calculating how far you can go to Lake Tahoe in 120 miles, um, but that quarantining piece is going to matter a lot. Um, again, it could possibly change as we go into orange. That's uh, that's a, a conservative 
uh, requirement in San Mateo County, but uh, it will impact both students and staff. Um, but we will make sure that staff are aware of it. I will also put it in the uh, in the parent updates around that. So great point, thank you. And that's all I have, thank you. Thank you. Okay, and then um, most of my questions were answered. I you know, mainly wanna thank all the teachers and staff and everyone who was on the task force and they have been working on this all the time, all, you know, all this time, day and night. Um, with the with the counselors and, and worrying about the students, especially the, the middle schoolers and stuff like that, our, um, our counselors right now, do they reach out um, to the students? I know you're talking about when they come back, but are they actively reaching out to the families, especially if a, a teacher has some that are not showing up on Zoom or, you know, or they can get some visual clue or, you know, if not the responsibility of the parent reaching out or the kid, but, but are the counselors checking in with the students? I'm gonna ask Julie to answer that question, but what I will say is that um, our, um, I know that uh, one of the counselors, and this doesn't mean that it's not happening in the with the other counselor, it's just that I don't know that, is that one of the counselors uh, saw that a student was really struggling and uh, just said, you know, I know if he comes in and uh, we do counseling face-to-face, -face, it would make a really big difference. And that was, I don't remember the period of time, but it was before uh, kids were coming in for learning hubs. And um, and so that level of reaching out, I thought was really um, admirable and uh, it has made it a world of difference. But Julie, how are the counselors seeking out clients? Sure. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, obviously such an incredibly complex, um, difficult time and, and um, challenge to reach families, reach students. Um, but I can tell you our, our counselors and mental health team have just been relentless in trying to do whatever they can to connect with students, maintain relationships, find um, interests, things that can help engage um, students, such as finding, you know, something they're really passionate about, like their guinea pig or any any kind of hook to really connect with them and use that as a way to just continue to be reaching out and talking to family members, coordinating um, needs through teachers and site administrators. So we, as the SOAP team, continues to meet along with um, the wellness team and uh, also a, a team of administrators and counselors where we look at attendance and we look at data to help us really um, find where our students are at. So um, there is a lot of intention around that and, and ways to be kind of calibrating all those all those pieces. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenging task because there is no doubt about it. Our, our, our kids are suffering, our students are, and we're, we're doing what we can to reach them. Care Solace has been a great um, resource that we've given our counselors training on so that they know um, how to connect families through that sort of concierge service. Um, so we are really hopeful that that's providing much related, any relief that we can to, to families in this time. Okay, yeah, because I'm sure that any, you know, any of the, the counselors can reach out because they may be in a dark hole where they don't reach out themselves. So right. We can send families. So we can't put that on them, so. Okay, did we have, I think that's, this was an information item. Everybody's had all the questions. Um, good discussion, everybody. Um, so now we have the um, item D, the resolution number 2021-03-10-A, notification to certified administrative employees of possible release, reassignment, or non-reelection. Alexis? Thank you. So sort of, uh, Certificated administrative employees may be released, reassigned, or non-reelected for employment from the district based upon necessary need to reduce a particular kind of service. Certificated administrators who are reassigned will be informed of their placement prior to the end of the school year. It is recommended that the board approve resolution 2021-03-10-A notification to a certificated administrative employee release, reassignment, or non-reelection. Okay, do we have any questions regarding this resolution? I'll go down the line. Um, Trustee Burkini? No questions. Trustee Steele? No questions. Trustee Villalobos? 
No questions. Okay, do I have a um, motion to, um, motion to accept resolution number 2021-03-10-A? I'll make a motion to pass uh, resolution number 2021-03-10-A. Okay, do I have a second? I'll second. Okay, Kelly, can you take the roll vote? Trustee Bradal. Yes. Trustee Brocchini. Yes. Trustee Steele. Yes. Trustee Villalobos. Yes. Thank you, the motion passes 4-0. Okay, item E, resolution, resolution number 2021-03-10-B. Notification of non-reelection of probationary certificated employees. Alexis? Thank you. So each school year, probationary teachers are released from employment from the district. The governing board may give notice of non-reelection to a certificated employee at any time during the employee's first year of service and any time up to and including March 15th of the employee's second year of, of, of a complete consecutive school year of employment. It is recommended that the board approve resolution number 2021-03-10-B, notification of non-reelection of a probationary certificated employee. Okay, um, I'm gonna on the list if there are any questions. Trustee Burkini? No questions. Okay, Trustee Steele? No questions. Trustee Villalobos? No questions. Okay, do I have a motion to approve resolution number 2021-03-10-B, notification of non-reelection of probationary certificated employees? All motion, all motion to approve. Do I have a second? Seconded. <laughs> okay. Can, uh, Kelly, can you take a vote? Trustee Bradal. Yes. Trustee Brocchini. Yes. Trustee Steele. Yes. Trustee Villalobos. Yes. Thank you. The motion passes 4-0. Okay, item F, resolution number 2021-03-10-C. Release of temporary certificated employees. Alexa? Thank you. Um, each school year teachers are released from employment from the district based upon temporary status due to either being part-time, not fully credentialed, or in an assignment for a permanent teacher on leave. Teachers who are released from employment may be hired for the upcoming school year should there be a need and if they have the proper credentialing status. It is re recommended that the board approve resolution number 2021-03-10-C, release of temporary certificated employees. Okay, well, do we have any questions? Um, Trustee Burkini? No questions. Trustee Steele? No questions. Trustee Villalobos? No questions. Okay, do I have a motion to approve resolution number 2021-03-10-C, release of temporary certificated employees? I'll make a motion to pass resolution 2021-03-10-C. Okay, do I have a second? I'll second that. Okay, Kelly, can you take the roll vote? Trustee Bradal. Yes. Trustee Brocchini. Yes. Trustee Steele. Yes. Trustee Villalobos. Yes. Thank you. The motion passes 4-0. Okay, item G, the MOU between the Asian American Recovery Services and Pacifica School District for the North County Outreach Collaborative Partnership with Pacifica Collaborative. Um, Josie, that one's yours. Thank you, Trustee Bradal. Tonight, we're asking you to approve this agreement um, with the Asian Recovery Service um, and North Outreach Collaborative. You know, the Pacifica School District has had a long-standing relationship with the Pacifica Collaborative. Many years ago, we did um, have a fiscal um, agent partnership with them, and we're asking you to approve again that we have a fiscal agency partnership with them so that we continue to support the services that they provide for the students of Pacifica. 
the agreement is attached in addition to um, a sample independent contractor agreement that we would also enter into with uh, Mary Beer. And basically what this does is Pacifica School District would act as the fiscal agent um, on behalf of this organization. Okay, I'm going to go down the list to see if anyone has any, any questions. Uh, Trustee Burkini? No questions. Trustee Steele? No questions. Trustee Villalobos? No questions. Okay, um, I'm going to have to abstain from this vote because I'm actually a, a current board of trustees um, on the board of directors for the Pacifica Resource Center. Uh, could we still go with the three? We, we have enough to vote. Okay. <laughs> Wasn't expecting someone to be gone, so. <laughs> I knew I had to abstain, but I didn't know we'd have two people gone. Um, so Kelly, can you take um, the roll call vote? Do we have a motion? Oh, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I interrupted myself. Uh, do we have a motion to approve the, um, the MOU between the Asian American Recovery Services and Pacifica School District? Make a motion. Good job. <laughs> Okay, do we have a second? I'll second. Okay, Kelly, now can you take the vote? Yes. Trustee Brocchini. Yes. Trustee Steele. Yes. Trustee Villalobos. Yes. Thank you, the motion passes 3-0. Okay, item H, oh, item H the uh, delegate, uh, CSBA 2021 CSBA delegate assembly election. Dr. Rolston. I'll go very quickly. Uh, there are uh, three spots open and there are three candidates and I uh, think that you should vote for them. We tried to put this in consent, but Kelly found out that we couldn't. So uh, I recommend that you vote for the three candidates, Greg Land from San Mateo High School District, uh, Dana Lujan from Sa uh, South San Francisco and Carrie Dubois from Sequoia Union High School District. Okay, I know two out of the three, so I'm I'm in favor of them. Um, do we uh, any questions, uh, Trustee Burkini? No questions. So. Okay, Trustee Steele. No questions. And Trustee Villalobos. No questions. And all motion to um, to approve the CSBA delegate assembly. Um, do I have a second? Second. Okay. Okay, Kelly, can you take the call, the vote? Trustee Bradal. Yes. Trustee Brocchini. Yes. Trustee Steele. Yes. Trustee Villalobos. Yes. Thank you, the motion passes 4-0. Okay, future agenda items. Okay, we are in the home stretch, isn't it? Amazing how hard the meeting is at 11 o'clock versus 7 o'clock. Um, okay, so just a couple of updates is that uh, the back to school nights that you may all have on your or open house nights that you may all have on your calendar. Those are very, very likely to change and they will be zoom back to school 2.0 meetings and that would be uh, likely a, a meeting with the classroom teacher virtually and then something hosted by the principal just as both a kind of review of official of uh, procedures but just an excitement like one of the things that's hard about this is uh, where we are and uh, the the how um, the anxiety that people are feeling is that this is a great thing, reopening schools, and people are really excited about it, and we want to celebrate that and honor that. And um, and uh, so those uh, open houses are going to change because we're going to look at them as uh, return to school orientations. Um, we need to bring uh, job share proposals. There are a few credentialing items we need to bring to you. Um, if you would like, uh, just a quick lottery update and projected enrollment in staffing. And then on the 31st, we can uh, do the resolution for land acknowledgement. We put that off with the uh, knowledge that we would be deep into the vaccines, but I think that's something that we can do on the 31st. And then I do think it is time to address the intra-district open enrollment for next year. You'll probably be hearing from parents is like, I'd like one more year of distance learning 
please hold my spot. Um, so I expect that as we uh, move forward with that, we'll be hearing from more parents around that. But I think it's uh, it's really an important one that because parents will make their decisions based on whether there's a spot based in their home school or not. So are there other items you'd like to put on the agenda for March 31st? Hearing none, just kidding, <laughs> Laverne. <laughs> Not for March 31st. Perfect. Anyone else? No. All right. I, think I want to thank full plate that day. Uh, What's that? I think we have a full plate that day. I think so too. I think we're going to have full plates from, from this <laughs> on, but I want to thank you for hanging in there. Uh, this is a long, long meeting. And you know, for the audience that's been sitting here, it's been four hours, but for the trustees, we've been meeting for five. So thank you for your stamina. Um, and uh, your patience as we dealt with our technology issues. So, Madam President. So we will adjourn the meeting at 10.59. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, bye-bye. <laughs> See you soon. Thank you, good night. Thank you.